Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! Hi! Today it's a special day because it's the 20th of March and it's lesson number 20. So, 2020, but it's 2021, so not really that special uh, after all. So, how are you doing? I'm watching the stream manager on my phone as always because recently I started using a double screen but I found myself more comfortable with just one screen uh, at a time and the mobile phone because sometimes I have to switch, uh, move windows around from one screen to the other and uh, it gets really frustrating. So I prefer one screen for now also because if I'm on the move then probably I don't have the ability to have multiple screens. So in that way, I'm, I'm not spoiled by the fact of having two screens and I can still do everything with one screen. Why am I saying this? For no reason at all, just to spend some time before starting the lesson because I believe that someone is still um, entering the, the classroom. I see Tiago and Sao in the house. Good morning to both. Hi. So nice to see you, as always. So, uh, last Saturday we had a very long lesson. It was a five hours marathon. And it was five hours long because the Saturday before that uh, we had a power outage in my city. So we had to cut short. And uh, last Saturday, so, we did a lot of stuff. And I assume, uh, I can expect that you were a bit puzzled by the amount of information. But in the end, we didn't do really that much. We actually just went through the slides about data types and we finished them all. That's it. So we already saw that there are methods belonging to primitives, strings, numbers... Um, there are multiple types of numbers, there are multiple methods that you can apply on strings. And we saw that strings are very similar to arrays. In fact, they look a little bit like immutable arrays of characters. Arrays are a special kind of object uh, in which you, that can store values ordered in some way with no key value pair, just the values. And you can mutate those arrays. In fact, you can push things or unshift if you want to insert elements from the bottom, from the start of the array. Hey, Angelo! Good morning, guys! Um, then you can remove elements from the array by using pop or shift. We probably... Yeah, we, also, we, can, also we can also remove elements uh, in the middle and also add elements in the middle. And that's pretty strange, but there's a method called splice, which is able to both remove elements and add elements. But there are also a lot of um, uh, immutable methods that you can use. For example, the slice, which should not be confused with splice, because slice is immutable. It uh, gives you um, a subset of the array, but it's a new array. It doesn't change the original array. And we also have seen many methods called map, filter, find, sum, every, reduce, etc., uh, etc., et which are able to iterate over an array without mutating it and perform some very cool operations on, the, on that array. Uh, it's not the only way you can iterate over an array. In fact, we can use the usual for loop with an index, or we can use the for of loop which is nice, but it doesn't give you any information about the current index. So if you also need the current index, the for of loop is not what you need. So we saw all of these array methods and probably we didn't even saw them all. In fact, there is another array method which I didn't even know it existed. Uh, and I saw it just yesterday. It's called flat map. Flat map is another method in arrays, and I think it's quite a new one. Let's see if, uh, if it tells us when it was introduced. Blah, blah, blah. ECMAScript 2662, okay. It's supported in every browser and not in the Internet Explorer, of course. But I don't see when it was introduced. Uh, it should say some somewhere where what was the version 
in which flat map was added. Anyway, flat map is not really that interesting for us. It's interesting in specific scenarios because it maps over an array, but if the array is an array of array, it flattens it into a single array. So it's, um, it's a way to combine map with uh, concatenating arrays spread or flat, which is another uh, method of arrays, which takes an array of arrays and flattens it into just one array. And you can also specify the depth to which you want to go. But it's advanced concept that we don't really care about right now. There are array methods which change the array. For example, splice changes the array, while slice does not change the array. Um, sort and reverse, they do change the array, while for each map, filter, reduce, those do not change the array. Uh, recognizing if an array was actually an array was pretty difficult in earlier days of JavaScript, but now we've got this method here called array.isArray given your array, which will tell you without any doubt if that is an array or not. Uh, we also saw a little bit of destructuring, so you can destructure arrays, which is a sugar syntax. It's a fancy way to just say, hey, if I know what an array what's the shape of the array, I can just say that I want to declare a variable called first, which is the first element of the array, and a variable that I will call second, which holds the value of the second element in the array, given that the array has a fixed number of elements. In that case, I can name them all. But if I don't know, then I can also use the spread operator, which allows me to uh, get the first elements of the array and, and then put all the rest inside its own array. So rest with this spread operator contains all the elements of the array, excluded the first one in this case. And the spread operator and the destructuring can be also created in the object. As you can see here, key two is probably a property that is present in the object and I'm going to call it with a variable my key. But key one is also a property in the object and I decide that I want to call the variable that holds the value of key one, key one. So that's why here I don't see key one column something else because this is exactly like saying key one column key one. And then I can put every other properties of the object inside of a rest property. This is the sub object that will contain all the other properties. And then we also saw a little bit of dates and times and uh, we explored how dates and times work in JavaScript and we also saw a sneak peek of libraries that allow you to manipulate formats and interact somehow with dates and time, which is actually a pretty difficult topic. Uh, every time I have to deal with dates and times, I... I, I really, I'm really scared because especially with time zones, it's really, really difficult to manipulate them. When you have to say something like, is it the start of the day? Is it the end of the day? Is this the weekend? Is this a holiday? Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. But, uh, and then you have to store these dates and you have to make them uh, available. Well, you have to make them work in every part of the world. So the start of the day in Italy is different from the start of the day in the US, for example, because we have different time zones. So it's actually pretty, pretty difficult to deal with dates and times. Um, but you will be able to do that. Also, I left you with some homework. And you know what? I probably am going to start this lesson by doing the homework. Because uh, last time, last Wednesday, we did a little bit of the tasks that we were supposed to do. And one last task was actually pretty difficult, maybe too much. And I don't really care about that task. Uh, it's probably shouldn't, it's probably not supposed to be there uh, in, in the tutorials since it's so difficult and the tutorial should be a beginner tutorial for JavaScript. So I don't care about that, but these are actually pretty easy. Uh, it's just a way to rehearse all of the array methods and to show you uh, a few cool things that you can do with array methods. So I'm going to do these, these exercises as for starters. And then what I have in program for today is probably instead of going forward with the program, 
we already have collected enough information to try and create our first web application. It will be a rough web application. It will not be a web application like something that you would ship online because it doesn't use any frameworks for now. But I want to start writing code in a way that we will make you comfortable as soon as we study frameworks like React or Vue.js or Angular or whatever. So we're going to create a toy project, which will actually work. And it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to guide you through the next step, which is uh, um, learning frameworks. So let's do these, these exercises here. Uh, write different functions on number arrays that do this and this and that. So I've got this array methods folder. I'm going to create another folder called homework as always. And here I'm going to create a new file called, I don't know, number arrays.js. And now we are ready to start. Okay. So first of all, write different functions on number arrays that print all items. How do I print all items? Let's do a small rehearsal of how to iterate over an array in order to print all the items. Let's say that our first array is something like this. Uh, R, it's called R, and um, it holds very stupid numbers. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that's it. Okay, this is our array. And now, if I want to loop over the array, I can do it multiple ways, a lot of ways. The first one is with indexes. So you already know the gist, and I'm going to go really fast on this because it's not something new, it's not something interesting. Right now, we are on lesson 20, so probably you're pretty bored of all these four loops for let i is equal to zero so we start with an index uh, that starts with zero and i should stop as soon as we reach the length of the array and then i plus plus in order to increment the, the index and then i can get the current item in the array by doing something like const item is equal r of i square bracket notation on arrays um, and then i can just print the item or if i want i can also print the index so uh, let's say i want to print the item and also the index i'll do it like this and that's it i don't need to create this variable if i don't want to i can just put r of i here but i think that's uh, just a little more clear if i make it explicit that the current item is just getting the array and getting the element at um, index i. Sorry, I got some notification, but, but that's fine. Okay, and what if I want to test this code? I found out a cool shortcut that I haven't discovered for multiple years, and it's called, for me, Control J. Control J will open the terminal right away. I didn't know about this, and it's a lifesaver for me. It's game changing. Uh, I love uh, keyboard shortcuts. But in this case, I also have to CD into array methods, homework, and then I'm in the right place. So here I can do node number arrays and check if the elements in the array are all printed. And they are. So we've got element one on index zero, element two on index one, element three on index two, etc., etc., because we start counting from zero in programming in general. So that's fine. Let's do another loop, which is the for of loop, which is only for arrays. And it's uh, actually easier because you can do for let item of array. And here you just console log the item. You don't have a reference to the index. So if you need the index, the for of loop will not help you. And you need to do either this or one of the array methods that I'm going to show you again uh, right now. So if I do it like this, now I execute it and I see that after all these pairs of uh, value and index, I also have one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, which is the result of this for loop. Awesome. And then finally, we can use another loop, which is an array method, a method that I can ask directly to the array. And it's like this, r.foreach 
in camel case. And for each is one of those array methods that accepts one uh, parameter, which is a callback function. And it's not mandatory, but callback functions are so nice when you write them as arrow functions. So instead of doing function, we just write something like fat arrow like this. In the parameters of this callback function, we have one mandatory Param well, actually, nothing is mandatory. You can just leave it like this, but it would be stupid. So we have one parameter, which is the current item. And optionally, if we want to, we can also have the index. We also have the original array if we really need to, if we really need it. And we also have something like the this arg, which is sometimes we call it the context. Uh, but I see here that the, this arg is not inside of the parameter. It looks like it's the second argument. It's here. Yep, probably it's here. So there's also an optional second parameter in the for each, which allows you to bind this callback function to some this that you provide from the outside. But it's not useful at all, especially if you're using arrow functions, because arrow functions, as you already know, bind the outer scope into the inner scope, which means that the this that you have outside of the loop, outside of this callback function, is identical to the this that you find inside of the function, which is something that in JavaScript we should never take for granted. F callback functions sometimes change the scope and the this that you find inside of those functions is not identical to the outside this. But arrow function ensure that these two this are identical so awesome what should i do now i should console log the item and the index and we're done i don't know why i have so many pop-ups going on with intellisense it's pretty annoying um let's see if it works yes it does so we've got all the numbers from one to seven along with their indexes, which is the first for loop. Then I've got all the numbers without the indexes or indices, it depends, uh, with a for of loop. And then again, I've got all the items with the indexes or the indices with the for each loop. And this is exa exactly what uh, I was asking in the homework here. I want to print all items and I would like to use different functions or number arrays. Let's call them methods. Then I want to create a new array containing the same numbers but doubled. How do I do this? Well, again, I can do it in multiple ways. Uh, if you want to use uh, the usual for loop, you can. You can use the for of loop. But if you know that the new array should have exactly the same number of elements as the original array, but every element is the result of changing the original element into a new element, though well, that's the perfect work for the map function. The map function maps every element in the original array to an element of the new array, which will be transformed by a function. What is this function? Well, we can call it, uh, we can give it a name. Since the numbers should be doubled, I can probably do something like create a function called double that given a number will give me number times two. Okay, I've got this function and I can use it. Uh, let me close the terminal for now. And now that I have double, I can create an array of doubles. I can, I can call it const doubles which is the result of asking the original array to map every single of its item with a new item that is the result of a transformation. And long story short, I can just put double here and it works. But how? Why? Why does it work like this? Well, because map works exactly like for each. So it needs a callback function that accepts let's create a callback function that accepts the current item and optionally also the index and optionally also the original array. But in this case, I just need the item. So in this callback function, I take the current item and I return 
what should be the results of the calculation. So for every single item in the original array, I will provide a new item, which is the result of a calculation that I specify in here. What is this calculation? It's something like return item times two. I want to double every single item and I want to return it inside of the callback function of the map method. So I will get the array of doubles. Well, if you look at this, the shape of this function, it's a function that takes one parameter, item, and returns the item doubled. This anonymous function that I see here is exactly the same as this function here. I'm just giving a different name for the parameter, but I can call it n if I want to. Uh, I have complete freedom on this. And if I don't see exactly the same shape, it's just that here I'm explicit. I, I'm, I'm making explicit the use of curly braces and the return statement. But you know that if an arrow function does one thing, and this one thing is returning something, you can even remove the curly braces and the return statement and just have this. So now you see that this is exactly the same as this, right? So instead of using an anonymous function here, I can use a reference to this function here. I just replace this value with the variable that holds the same value. And that's why I can just specify a function called double and I'd say, uh, and I place it like, like this just as a reference to the same function. And as you can see, this is a very declarative way of specifying how to double every element in the array. Doubles is equal to, hey array, please map every one of your elements with the double function. Double them all. Uh, I, I, I usually read it like this. Hey array, double every item. And that's the result. If I want to do it with other loops, I can, but it will be a little more complex than this. For example, if I want to do it with the for the usual for loop, this one here, let's do it. I have to create an array of doubles, which at first is empty. Then I have to loop over every single item in the original array. And then for every item that I find, I can push into the array of doubles the ith element, the nth element in the array, but doubled. And this creates exactly the same thing that I have here. But here, it's just one line of code. Well, actually two lines of code if I, uh, if I also uh, take the double function as part of the algorithm. And it's very declarative, it's very readable. Here, I am a little bit confused on the details of what's happening because I have to start with an empty array, loop over the arrays, push inside of the array the result of a calculation, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually here I can just say double, not subble, double of R of I. So I don't need to, I, I can reuse this uh, double function if I want to. Okay, so this is very explicit. This is very imperative which means that I'm saying, hey, computer, do this, do this, and do that. This instead is very declarative because it's saying, hey, the new array should have this shape. Okay, you see the difference between imperative and declarative? Hopefully. Okay, I don't like the imperative way. <laughs> you can use it, of course. Uh, you can also use the for of. Let's do the for of now. Um, I just need to remove this part here and just say let item of array and since now I just need the item I can just say hey double the item this is already a little better than before because I'm not confused by the noise that is borrowed by all this index uh, incrementing etc etc I'm just saying hey for every item of the array double the item and put it in the array of doubles that's fine but this is probably even better whenever you have the ability to uh, solve a trivial problem in a trivial way, I would prefer this trivial way because it, uh, it allows you to focus on more complex problems. And that's the power of languages. You can build solutions on top of other solutions. Okay, 
This is the doubles, and if you want to check if it works, I can just do a console log doubles. But right now the Node.js thing will be quite crowded. So let's do something like this. I'm going to wrap all these four loops into a function, as we always do. Function print items. And I will never invoke this function. So it's a way to, instead of commenting out all the code, I'm just wrapping it inside of a function and I'm never invoking it. So it's exactly like commenting out all the code, but it's uh, probably nicer. And in here, I can do something similar. I can say function double items. It's a function that if I want, I can invoke it. Otherwise, I won't invoke it. But right now, I'm going to invoke it because I want to see what happens. So double items and I'm going to run again this code on Node.js. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So I've got a new array which contains all these elements which are doubled. I don't understand why we have all these new lines and, uh, and sp extra spaces, but yeah, apparently it still works. Under OK, what OS do you use? I'm currently using Ubuntu. Ubuntu Linux, which is fine, uh, but I'm probably going to switch to some, uh, uh, how you call it, a rolling uh, distro, rolling release distro, because every six months Ubuntu asks me to update the whole system and sometimes it happens that I got things not working anymore as expected. So I would prefer to use something like, I don't know, Manjaro maybe. Uh, which is another very uh, famous uh, Linux distribution recently. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Linux user, mostly. Uh, sometimes I need to use Windows, almost never Mac, but uh, I, I feel very comfortable with, with Linux. Okay, so we created the double items. Uh, now, what do we have? Check if an array has at least one even number. Okay, let's do this. Uh, let's call this uh, has even and we can start coding right away but you know what before even trying to solve this thing I'm going to ask myself how do I check if one number is even well we already know it we did it multiple times and you know what I'm going to sorry I'm messing up Okay, uh, I'm going to put all of these support functions at the beginning of my file because I think they are cleaner. So here I can create a function called isEven and as a function I would call it a predicate because it's a function that returns a boolean, either true or false. But it's a function, it's just a function that returns a boolean. A predicate is nothing more than that. So const isEven, giving a number, will tell me if the number is even if, when using the remainder operator, I see that the remainder of the integer division is zero. So we already know the recipe of this. We can say, if the remainder of the integer division by two is equal to zero, then it means that the number is even. And that's it. We don't need to do anything more than that. It's just a recipe that you learn by heart. And of course, it's much better if you understand what it means. And if you don't remember what it means, if you want to have a rehearsal, here we are. Just ask me. That's no problem. But now we've got this function is even, which we can use and reuse. We can even forget how it works. We can just call is even given a number and it will tell us if the number is even or not. Now, here we want to check if the array has at least one even number. We can do it in multiple ways. We can iterate over the elements. We can find the first even number that we find, uh, that, that, that we see, and then return that even number or something like that. But the function, the, the requirements is, I just want to check if the array has an even number. I don't want to have it returned to me. I don't care about what is the even number. I just need to know if there is at least one even number. And there is a function, there is an array method for that. The array method is called sum. 
because sum is uh, checking if there is at least one element that satisfies a certain predicate. So I can say const uh, has even, I don't know, is equal to array dot sum is even. And that's it. Again, uh, it's the same gist of the double items. I can write an explicit arrow function here that for every item in the array checks if the item is even. But if I already have this function somewhere, I can just pass a reference to that function. And I'm okay, I'm already done. So I can just do console log has even, and this probably will tell me, yes, it has an even number. Let me check it out, has even, let's invoke this function. Or, you know what, let's invoke this function with different arrays. So I'm passing the array into the function, and I'm going to pass one, two, three, four, five, and this will tell me true, probably, hopefully. And this other one, uh, let's say one, three, five, seven, should tell me false. So at the end of the day, if I, in, if I execute this node program, I should have true and false printed out to me. Let's see if it works. Oh, not clear, clear. Yep, true and false. So this thing is working. As you can see, I don't need to do any complex stuff with the array methods. I don't need to really iterate over the arrays and find if there is an even number. I'm leveraging the fact that I have already some ready-made functions, ready available, that I can reuse immediately, and I use them in, an, in a declarative way. I encourage you, as I already encouraged you last Saturday, to try and um, implement these uh, requirements every with every in every single uh, way that you can imagine just like i started doing with print items you can do it with indexes or indices you can do it with a for of loop well, you can even do it with a for each loop which is still a loop or you can try to use and or you can use the array the proper array method that will allow you to write the least amount of code just like i'm doing Okay, this was has even, so check if all items are even. This is actually pretty easy if you remember that there is uh, another array method called every, which checks not if at least one item is even, but if every single item of the array is even or not. So I can say something like uh, all even, given some array, will check if, uh, let's... Uh, you know what? I'm not going to declare a constant. I'm just going to console log immediately. Um, I'm going to, to print the fact that every single array is even. Look how similar to the English language this is. Well, log, print, the fact that every item in the array is even. That's it. Don't need, it looks almost like magic. That's why I love array methods. So if I check if all even, ooh, all even of an array called, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five will tell me false because not all the items are even here. But if I say all even of two, four, eight, sixteen, this should be give me true because those items are all even. So let's try clear a node. Yep, the first one is false, the second one is true, which means that these are not all even, but these are. And as always, yeah, you can use another way and you should, especially in this case, you should try to create another array. You know what? Let's do it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to use the for of loop because it allows me to avoid creating this index every single time. So how do I check if uh, the array has at least one even number? I have to start with an assumption. The assumption is, yes, the array has at least one even number. Or the assumption could be exactly the opposite. No, the uh, function does, the array does not have at least one single item. I'm going to start with the false. I'm going to say, start with the fact that it doesn't have a single number and you will see why. So let's, um, I'm, I'm going to call it has even. 
is equal to false. No, this array do doesn't have any even number. But then I'm looping over every item of the array. And if the item is even, so I can say if is even of item, then my initial assumption was wrong. And I can now say that has even is true. So you see why I started with false. Uh, you can also think it like this. If you haven't inspected any item in the array, or if the array is empty, it has no items at all, well, the item, well, the array doesn't have any even numbers. Well, it has no items, so not no even items, right? But then I start iterating over the array, and as soon as I find one even number, then I can say, yeah, it has one even number. So my initial assumption was wrong, and I have to update this information. If this seems not performant enough for you, you can probably break the loop, or you can return true, if this is a function that returns a value, and that's fine. But I wouldn't mind too much on, uh, on this thing. At the end of the loop, I will have the correct answer. So that's it. This is what we would do with the full loop. If you want to check instead if the items are all even, uh, this is slightly different. Very similar, but slightly different. We start with a variable that should be initialized with some value. And if I start with the same assumption as before, I would say that if the array is empty, then all of the items in the array are not even. There's no items in the array, so I should probably say false. But I think that this is not going to work in this case. Uh, for exp <laughs> well, based on experience, I would start with true, and then you will see why. So here, I can still full loop over all the items, and then let's see what happens. If I find one item that is not even, then my initial assumption was wrong. And I will say that no, not every item in the array is even. So I hope that you see the slight difference. Here, I want to check if all the items are even. So as soon as I find an experiment, a case that contradicts my initial assumption, then I'm going to change my assumption. You remember my continuous lessons about the confirmation bias? This is it. I start with an assumption and I try that experiment which actually rejects my hypothesis, not the, not the experiment that confirms my hypothesis, because that will never give me any information. So if I say, if the item is even, I don't care because I was already assuming that all the items were even. So if I find an even item, this just confirms my initial assumption. And this is not really that useful in this case. If I want to check if all items are even, then I have to look for something that rejects my hypothesis. As soon as I find some item that is not even, then in that case, I have some new information. No, the items are not all even, okay? And this is a common recipe. When you have to check if there is at least one element with, um, which satisfies a property, you start by saying, no, there is no such element. And then as soon as you find one, you say, oh yeah, there was such an element. And on the opposite, if you have to check if all the elements um, are subject to some, uh, to some condition, then you start assuming that yes, all the items are like this, and as, as soon as you find one item that rejects the hypothesis, then you say, oh no, I was wrong. The items were not all even, okay? Let me just change this code a little bit like, uh, so it uh, looks uh, like the one below and also it removes any, okay, any, um, as I say, any ESLint problems. Now we've got only ESLint warnings, but not ESLint errors. Okay, so as you can see, this requires a little bit of thought. And since we are doing uh, a lesson, an academy, 
you have to try these things because you have to think about solutions. But then, as soon as you're confident with that, you can use array methods which just allow you to write everything in one line of code without even thinking of this confirmation bias. Let's start with true, then we'll make it false. Uh, the array.every will take care of this problem. Let's go on. So this was check if array, no, this was check if all items are even. Then return the first even number or undefined. How do I return the first even number or undefined? Well, there is uh, an array method that we can use right away. Function uh, get first even number or just get first even since I never thought, uh, I never discussed about uh, numbers. Uh, and here I can just, for, same, for example, console log array dot find. Find is another method in the arrays that will, ch will return the first item it finds that satisfies the predicate that you pass, the callback function that you pass. What is the callback function? Is even, as always. We are reusing the same function over and over again. And if it doesn't find any number that satisfies this predicate, it will just return undefined. That's it. I'm not going to even going to test it. As you can see, the code is exactly the same as sum or every. You just change the name of the method and you're already done. So this will give you the first even number. Uh, you can try it yourself. Just do an all even with, a, with, with an array as input and you can try. Then return an array of even numbers or an empty one. So if I want to return an array that only has the even numbers given the input array or an empty one if there are no even numbers, well, this is a job for the other um, array method called filter, which filters the array given some predicate. So it will not just give you the first item that satisfies the predicate, but it will give you every item that satisfies the predicate. So as you can see, it's very, uh, can we say specular? Uh, find is very similar to sum, but this just gives you the boolean. This, this instead gives you the actual result. And every just gives you the boolean, while filter will give you the array of results. So here, in order to have um, get evens given an array, you can console log array.filter is even. And that's it. You are filtering the array uh, getting all the even numbers. Remember that all these methods will never change the original array. This is going to give you a different array which contains only the selected elements, the filtered elements. Filtered with this predicate is even. And then uh, sum the numbers together. Okay, this is the first time we introduce the reduce function, at least for today, because we already introduced it multiple times um, last Wednesday and last Saturday. So if I want to sum, ooh, if I want to sum all the numbers in the array, I can do something like r.reduce. How does reduce work? It's slightly different from the other methods. It's the only one that is really actually different because reduce accepts two parameters. The first parameter is the callback function, but the second parameter is the initial value of an accumulator. Why do I need an accumulator? Well, we already saw today some situations in which I need an accumulator. For example, here, when we were trying to double the items, we started with an empty array and then we accumulated values inside of this array. And finally, we have the new a value that we can print or we can reuse however we want. So having a variable that starts with an initial value, it gets accumulated. For example, this array gets pushed, but you can have multiple other accumulators. This is some sort of accumulator. You start with false and then you accumulate the results. It's not really accumulating. It's just uh, changing the result at a certain point, but it's actually exactly the same. So reduce is a method that allows you to do this kind of initialize a variable, accumulate the results or change the results along the way, and then finally return that results in the end. 
uh, without using an explicit for loop. You don't need to use a for loop, you can use the reduce. So for example, if we want the sum, we already know that usually we create a variable called sum, which starts with zero, and then we accumulate the sum with every item that we find in the array. And at the end, we will have the sum. So we start with zero. This is the second parameter of the reduce function, the initial value of the accumulator. And then the peculiar part of this callback function is that it has a slightly different shape. The first parameter in this callback function is not the current item. This is the second parameter. The first parameter is actually the current, the accumulator. The accumulator on first iteration will be zero because I specified that it's zero. But then at every single iteration, I'm going to change the value of the accumulator and I'm going to return the current value of the accumulator for the next iteration. And when I have run out of items in the array, this value, the final value of the accumulator, will be returned as the result of the reduce function. So const sum is equal to whatever was accumulated starting from zero. And here I can say, for example, ack will be incremented with the current item. And then I can just return the ack for the next iteration. I can do like this, or I can just say, which is equivalent, return the accumulator, the current value of the accumulator plus the item without you needing to change the accumulator per se. I can do it like this. And I like it better like this because for two reasons mainly. The first reason is that now we have an arrow function that does one thing and the only thing that it does is returning the result of an expression, which means that I can remove the curly braces and the return statement. And this seems so nice now. And now I can even see that this function has a shape that I recognize. In fact, if I don't call this ack and I don't call this item, but I call them, for example, I don't know, A and B, or X and Y, or num1 and num2, this is a function that creates a sum. This is the sum of two numbers. It's nothing more than that. So I can go on the top of my file, define a function called sum, which takes, let's call them N1 and N2, which is the same, and this will give me n1 plus n2. This function is a stupid function that does the sum of two numbers, but now this function can be also used in other contexts. For example, if I replace this anonymous, anonymous function with the reference to that function, the reduce starts being really, really easy to read. I have a name clash here, uh, so I have to say some items. This is the sum of all items in the array. Now I, I remove the name clash. So if I do console log of array reduce, this will actually give me the sum of all the uh, elements in the array without me needing to do something like, let's do it just, uh, just for fun. Let sum is equal to zero. Then function, uh, what, what function? For let item of array, sum gets increased with the current item, and then finally I've got the sum. Instead of doing all of this stuff imperatively, imperatively, in pr procedurally, <laughs> I'm going to do it with array.reduce sum zero, which can be read as hey, array, reduce yourself as the sum of all your elements starting from zero. Okay, so it's more declarative. Let's, uh, let's try it. I'm going to comment out this and I'm going to do some items. Ooh, okay. Some items given the array, let's say one, two, three, four, five. And then I also want to sum the items. Uh, I don't know, uh, let's do all the even numbers, two, four, eight, that's it. Okay, I'm going to try these two and open the terminal, clear node number arrays. Okay, apparently the sum of all the numbers from one to five is 15, which makes sense because I remember that all the numbers from one to four is 10. So if I add a five, it will be 15. And two plus four plus eight is 14. 
which is true because 8 plus 4 is 12 plus 2 is 14 so yeah it works okay but there's also another cool thing about the reduce function which sometimes is overlooked and i overlooked it last uh, week and uh, there was bobby who uh, who incurred in this in, in a problem which was due to the fact that we didn't see reduce in all of its nuances reduce can be used in two different ways if you specify the initial value of the accumulator well this is exactly what we've done uh, you can specify zero or even five like in this case what happens in this case it will do if the array is one two three four it will do one plus two plus three plus four plus the initial five because this was the initial value of the accumulator in our case we did zero plus one plus two plus three plus four but sometimes you just need to sum all the elements in the array and you don't want to start with zero maybe you want to start with the first element in the array this is actually a, a little more performance we don't care about performance but still uh, if we want to sum all the elements in an array we can also start not with just zero we can start with the first element in the array and then we sum all the other elements how do i do this with a single with with a with, with a usual for loop well here i cannot do this because i don't have any control on the items that i iterate over i'm iterating over all of them and that's it i can do anything i have to use the index let sum is equal to array of zero so i start the sum with the first element in the array and then i can loop over an i that starts with the next element in the array and stops as always with the r dot length i plus plus and then i will increment the sum with r of i as you can see there is a slight slight difference instead of starting with zero i'm starting the sum with the first element of the array and then i'm accumulating every following item in the array which is slightly more performant because i'm doing one fewer addition and that's it that's not really that important but the reduce function makes it free of charge in fact you can even call reduce without the second parameter and by default the initial value of the accumulator will be the first element in the array so you can also call it like this the array is reduced to the sum of its elements without even specifying which was the initial value of the accumulator and this gives you no results because i have this uh th these two to be commented out as always okay let's try again the numbers are still 15 and 14 which means that this is working even if i don't specify the initial value of the accumulator the sum is not 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 it's just 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 that was actually pretty difficult to spell okay i hope uh, you you got it so seems like nice and seems like it's uh, probably the way we're going to use reduce forever and ever without the initial value of the accumulator but this is where we could be wrong in fact sorry there's also another cool exercises uh, exercise here which is the most important one for me get all the even numbers square them then add them together how do i solve this task i can solve it in multiple ways and i will show you all these ways so i should first of all filter all the even numbers then i have to square them then i have to add them together okay um i'm going to call this function sum squares of evens okay because i'm going to sum all the square the, 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 the all the even numbers squared okay so how do i do this well in the traditional way i should probably loop over the items something like this for let's item of array 
and then if the item is even because I want to just filter the even items so if the item is even then I want to double it so I can say const double no I cannot say double because there's already a function called double here uh, so let's not do it let's just say double of item and this double of item will be added to some sum which starts from zero and will be incremented with the current double and there we are we can do a console log of this sum and see what happens so as you can see in one loop i'm doing all three things together i'm looping over the items i'm filtering only the items that i care about in this case all the even items and then for every even item i create the double of that item and i accumulate the sum in order to have finally the result that i wanted so sum square of evens will do something like um, one two three let's see what happens with uh, this simple array um, control J, node to number arrays, four. Apparently it's four. Why is it four? Because one squared is one, two squared is four, and this is not working at all. So what am I doing wrong? Let's see. Did it really tell me four? Yeah, it did. Okay, there's an error in here. Can someone find the error? Let me check the functions here. Double item, yeah, this is fine. Why is it saying four? It's, sh oh yeah, well, of course, the, uh, the others are not even. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, it returns just two squared. I forgot that the, the, the fact that the item is, uh, should be even. So the only even item here is two. And so it just returns four. That's cool. Uh, let's find also, let's try with also a, another another even item in the array. I'm tired. <laughs> and now it says 12. Why is it 12? Because it says 2 squared, which is 4, plus it should say 4 squared, which is 16. 16 plus 4 is 20. And this, oh, wait a second. And this is not what I expected. So there's another problem here. What did I do wrong now? Please help me because I have <laughs> no idea today. I'm too tired. I have num times two and not num times num. Um, oh yeah, of course, these are double, they are not squared, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I said square them, not double. And this is the problem. I have to create another function, maybe called square, which is n times n, or we can call it even n to the power of two. We also have this other um, operator here. Uh, I'm, I'm really confused today. I don't know why. Okay, as you can see now, this is square. This is double and I said that I want to sum all the items squared, not doubled. So I'm going to square the items if they are even and this should give me 20. Yay! Thanks a lot, Bobby, for the support. Love your feedbacks, guys. Okay, so this is already a good way to solve the sum of squares, but what if I want to use array methods? Well, one way we could do this is to use the reduce function, and we can do something like r.reduce, and reduce accepts two parameters. We start with a sum that is zero, and the callback function instead takes the current value of the accumulator and the current item. And in here, we are going to do all these calculations. So now we are already initializing the sum because it's here. We are already iterating over all the items because this is what the reduce function does. So the only thing that we need to do is to check if the item is even and square it and accumulate on the accumulator. So if the item is even, then I'm going to square it and I can even accumulate it on the accumulator like this, square item. 
as you can see, it's really, really similar to what we have here. Instead of in looping explicitly and having one extra line for the sum, we are instead using the reduce function, which takes care of iterating over every item in the array, and the initialization is here. But it should be exactly the same. I'm going to console log this one here. And let's see what it says. I'm going to also put the console log here, so we've got both results. And I am hoping that these two give us the same results. And it does not, because, because I'm not returning the accumulator. I'm accumulating, but I have to remember that at the end of the callback function, I also have to return the accumulator, right? So return the current value of the accumulator so it can be used in the next iteration. If you prefer um, ternary operators, you can. You can do something fancy like uh, return. If the number is even, then I'm going to return the accumulator plus the item squared. Ooh, wait a second. Okay, otherwise I'm going to return the accumulator as it is because I don't need to do anything else. If I do it like this, it's fine. I can even see that this is a sum, so I can even probably use the sum function if I really want to, like this. And since this is one function that does one thing, and it, that one thing is returning uh, the result of an expression, even if it's complex, I can, as always, remove the curly braces and the return statement. And now this code is actually pretty difficult to read. Uh, I he even have to scroll left and right to understand it. But in fact, I'm not saying that this is a better code. It's just more concise. It's just one, a one-liner. But I would probably never write code like this. But just for, as an experiment, let's see if it works. And it doesn't. Sum is not a function. What? Oh, wait a second, because I've got the sum written like here. Okay, sorry. And now what do you think about this? Okay, now the sum is 20. So this reduce function, even though it's very strange, complicated, convoluted, very difficult to read, it's actually performing exactly the same operations as this for loop. If I had a look at these two, I would probably prefer this for loop here because it's more explicit, because it's, uh, it allows me to understand better uh, what, I, what is happening. In here, it's not really that uh, clear what I'm doing. So why bother with array methods here? Why bother with array reduce? Well, because there's also another way to solve this problem, which is slightly less performant probably, but from a computational point of view, it's actually identical. And it's much, much more readable than what we've done so far. We can chain those methods together. I can do something like this. Do I have to, first of all, filter the arrays? Then let's filter the arrays. Const events is equal to, hey, take the array and filter it by, with the predicate is even. Now we've got all the even numbers. Now I want all the squares of those evens, right? So I can say const squares is equal to, hey, you know the evens of before? You can now map them with the square function. And now that I've got the array of all the evens squared, I can sum them up. I can do a console log of squares reduce with the sum. And I can even say start with the first element in the array. I didn't do it here. And I didn't do it here because there's a small problem happening in this reduce function. But let's see it later on. So as you can see, I'm splitting the code into multiple steps right now. I'm first of all, getting from the array all the even numbers. Then once I have the even numbers, I'm going to square them. 
And once I've got all the squares, I sum them all. And this is going to probably give me exactly the same result, hopefully. Let's see. Okay, finally, <laughs> something that works on the first try. Okay, cool. But now, if I really want to, I can even omit all these variable declarations. In fact, if the result of this filter now is an array to which I can ask to map, then I can just do something like this. The squares are, hey, take the original array, filter the items. Wait a second. Hey, original array, filter the items, given is even, and with that result that I'm not storing in a variable, I'm just going to map and having the squares. And the same can be done in here. Instead of you storing the partial results in the square variable, I can put it here. And now I just have a chain of executions here. I start from the original array, I filter out all the even items, then all these even items will be squared, and finally I sum them all together. Bobby, the small, problems should, the small problem should occur only if the first number is even. Trust me, I've been there. Okay, okay, let's see. So, as you can see, this chain of methods is actually pretty cool. And sometimes if you have a longer chain, these methods will even be indented automatically by Prettier, like so. Something like this. Prettier is not going to keep me the, the, to keep this information, this, this indentation. But who cares? As you can see, I start with an array, I filter all the even items, I map all the squares, and then I reduce to the sum. The cool thing about this is that is it's actually pretty easy then to change uh, the algorithm, if I re if I really need to, um, by just moving things around or even ch turn changing um, some of the functions. For example, what if I want to not square the events but double them? I just do this. I replace the reference to square with a reference to the function double, which doubles the items instead of squaring them. And what if I first, what if I want to double them and then filter them? Well, I can just move the map one line above. Now I'm doubling all the items and then I'm filtering all the events, which is kind of stupid because if I double the items, they will always be even. So um, what about squares? If I square three, it will give me nine, which is still odd. So yeah, I can square, then check the items that are even, then reduce everything to the sum. So as you can see, it's really, really easy to change the behavior of this function if I really, if I really need to. This code is more flexible. It's even more readable, probably, if I look at the chain of the events, how they occur, instead of looking at this function here. It's a little more difficult to just uh, change something here. For example, what if I want to first square everything and then sum all the even numbers? I have to pay extra effort. I have to say something like this. I have to square the item. So const squared item is equal to square of item. And then if the squared item is even, then only in that case I'm going to sum increase the sum with the squared item, right? This is what happens if I try to invert the order of these two operations. First I want to square, then I want to check if it's even. And I have to write some pretty different code in here. But with array methods, like this one, and especially if they are indented the way I like, so let's do, yay! I tricked Pritya by just adding a comment. Now, if I want to square and then check if it's even, alt up, done. You see why I care so much about array methods? They make our code more functional because this is part of functional programming and they make our code more powerful, more flexible, 
by using functions, mixing them together, chain, chaining them, and having all these functions written as small Lego bricks. They are small building blocks that I can use and reuse in multiple different ways. I love this thing about functional programming. I hate some things about functional programming. For example, if you try to understand monads, good luck, because I never understood why should I care about a monad. But apart from that, this is pretty, pretty nice, pretty interesting. So uh, let's go back to the problem that Bobby is mentioning. Um, I know that I can reduce all the items in the array as their sum and I don't even need to specify the zero because if I don't specify the initial value of the accumulator then the sum will start summing from the first item it finds in the array. So it should be the same with this other reduce function, right? I can just remove the zero. And yes, it probably works exactly the same. Uh, let's try. Nope, it's 21. Hmm, what happened here? So, to understand what happened here, we have to probably check, uh, do some doc debugging and check what happens at every single iteration. So, the array is 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so we start with an accumulator that is 1. Apparently, we start with one and then if the item is even, which is not, so I'm going to the else, I'm going to return one. On the first iteration, I start with one and the accumulator has the value of one. On the second iteration, the item is the second number, which is two. The accumulator is one still. So I've got two as the second item. And now the accumulator will hold the same value as before plus the square. So 1 plus the square of 2, which is 4, so it's going to give me 5. All right, I thought it would skip the accumulator equal to 1 as it is odd. No, it doesn't. And you use the emoji, the inglorious emoji in some, some way that... <laughs> what is that, a beard? It looks like a beard. What is that? Lovely. <laughs> I didn't even know that you could combine. Yeah, it has a beard. Okay. Oh, bearded inglorious logo. Uh, where is that? I see it here too. Nice. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know you could mix them all. Cool. So apparently um, Twitch's emojis work pretty much the same as these functions that we are seeing together. So as you can see, there's still there's something fishy going on because I wanted to skip the one I don't want this one to be in the sum, in the final sum. And that's the reason why we should always add the zero in this case, because otherwise it's going to take into account the first item, which is an item that we actually wanted to skip since it's not even. Instead, in here it works because the reduce is performed only after. First of all, I'm filtering all the items, then I'm mapping the squares, and then I want to sum all of these squares. So I can start with zero, but I can also not start with zero, and it will give me exactly the same result. Because filter is even, starting from one, two, three, four, will give me an array which is two and four. And that's it. So, the, okay, that, that's a good, uh, a good way to use these comments instead of just saying yay. I start with an array which is 1, 2, 3, 4. Then I filter all the events which is 2, 4. Then I'm mapping the squares which should be 4 and 16. And then I reduce every item to the sum uh, of all the items. So this will be 20. You see how easy it is? try to understand it in this scenario it's a little more complicated and that's it for the homework that i gave you then about um, uh, well exercises on dates etc i don't think that they are really relevant right now uh, i would like to instead focus more on something that is a little more usable right now. So I heard already someone saying, okay, this is really nice. 
All of this is really nice, but it's so abstract. When are we going to build something for the web? When are we going to create a real application? Well, right now. We're going to start right now. We haven't covered certain concepts, concepts yet. In fact, we started seeing something about functions. We should still see a little bit of inheritance, classes. We should see something about throwing and catching errors. We should see a little bit of asynchronous JavaScript. And this is pretty important because one of the main natures of JavaScript it is asynchronous nature. So this is really, really important. And we will see modules. And I think that these two are pretty um, optional. Well, browser, we will see something today uh, because we want to create a, an application for the browser. But we're going to create some uh, stub application, which is completely improvised. I'm, say, I'm telling you, I never tried it uh, before this way. So I hope it works. And um, but we don't care classes, we don't need inheritance and errors and asynchronous behavior for now. So we're going to build something that doesn't need all these features. And then we can improve on the initial solution, creating something bigger. OK. So this was number arrays. And now I'm going to create a new file called to do's JS. And I'm going to try to go very, very slow. This way I will be first more accurate. And secondly, I will give you the time to code along with me. I see some graphical errors in my Visual Studio code. Whenever I type something, it adds strange things. And I, now I also see some uh, <laughs> broken pixels here. But everything's fine. Everything's fine. So what is to do's JS? To do's JS will be a very bare bones and probably almost failed attempt at creating a to-do list application. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Right, Roy. Yep, nope, doesn't work. I should probably turn all Visual Studio Code off again, or even the computer, and I don't care about that. Love the uh, IT Crowd reference, by the way. And if you haven't watched the IT Crowd, please do it. It's awesome. I'm also watching The Office recently uh, for the first time. That's also quite nice, but I probably prefer the IT crowd, maybe because of the British humor. Okay, so what is the to-do's application? Well, the to-do's application is a ugly copy of this experiment here. To-do MVC is a website that showcases the same application implemented in multiple ways. For example, there are multiple frameworks out there. Some are really outdated. For example, Backbone or Knockout or Ember, AngularJS. These are old. These are all old frameworks. But there are also some new frameworks like React. Well, current frameworks: React, Vue.js. There should also be Angular somewhere, which is not AngularJS. AngularJS is, let's say, version one, but Angular is something completely different that is the successor of AngularJS, but it's completely different. And I don't see it. This is AngularJS. This is Angular Dart. There must be Angular 2. Oh, OK, Angular 2.0. Yeah. And there's also Aurelia, which I really liked, but then it was superseded by other, other frameworks. In German, Netflix, you can't watch The Office, but if you use another location via VPN, you can see US Netflix as well. Hackerman. Awesome. Um, I'm not going to tell you how I'm using, um, I'm seeing the office. Uh, but yeah, I use some hacks too, let's say. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I know that many YouTube videos are something like, hey, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, something like that. I recently discovered something like call, called Rise Up VPN. And if I understood it correctly, Rise Up VPN is completely free. You don't need to pay. You can donate if you want to, of course, but you can use this one completely for free. So this is not my sponsor. I smell a pirate. No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> you can use Rise Up VPN if you want to. Uh, I have it installed. I don't use it. 
usually, but uh, if you install it, you turn it on and it just works without having to pay. Your sponsor is Raid Shadow Legends, right? No, not even. My sponsor is Miss Quackers, which I also left uh, unreachable. So right now my sponsor will be, I don't know, this mouse, which is not even attached. So to do MVC, MVC is a beautiful application that we will not create identical, not at all. In fact, you see that it's a list of things to be done. I already have three items to do. Learn JavaScript, seek for a job, and then forget everything. And I can even check some items as completed, as done. I usually call them done. Or I can uncheck them. I could even probably change the text by double-clicking. Yeah, this is already an advanced feature, which I don't know if I want to, to do it. And I can also remove the items by clicking on the X. And of course, I can also... Uh, teach on Twitch and if I press enter I can teach on Twitch which is probably not a good move after I forget everything I should probably teach on Twitch and then I can forget everything but anyway uh, I it seems to be not be able to move these items either which is a bummer but it's uh, lucky for me because I don't want to also add this feature so these are all very uh, advanced features. For now, I would like to have a form that allows me to add a new item and I will see the list of items. This would will already be something to, uh, to, to display, okay? Let's see what we can do. So first of all, we could, where should we start from? We could start from uh, the logic of having an array of to-dos and the logic of uh, uh, displaying them uh, or adding a to-do, removing a to-do or changing its value or something like that. Or we could start from the interface. We create a static interface and then we try to attach the logic to that interface. These are two very valid approaches. As always, you can start top down, you can start bottom up, you can start from a specific feature and try to implement it from the surface to the core. Or you can start everything from the surface and then dig down in all the features. I think that, as, as I probably already mentioned, the best approach would be um, a mix of iterative and incremental. Because usually a software is really complex, so you want to approach it in multiple ways at the same time. Um, I probably already showed you this image here, which I use in my courses about um, project management and, uh, and, and design and architectures. Uh, we can say that the iterative model is starting with a rough sketch and, uh, well, f finalizing the sketch better and better. The incremental model creates a piece of the painting uh, as as defined as possible, as final as possible. And then you go to the next piece and you try to make it as good as possible. And then finally you get here. I think that both approaches do not work nowadays for complex projects. You want a mix of both. And probably there is some... Yeah, I love this picture here. Because there's a, a stick figure here. That's the only reason I love this picture. So it's much better to have both iterative and incremental. You start by sketching out the whole painting and you start refining the main feature of that painting. So the face, for example, of the Mona Lisa. And then once you've got this part completed, well, this is already a painting that you can sell, but you can just cut it out, you crop it, and you have a beautiful painting of a beautiful lady. But, of course, if you want to continue, this is already, as you can see, a deliverable item. You can already present it to someone and it can already be enjoyed. But then you can continue by refining the secondary feature of this painting. And then, finally, you complete the rest. So, as you can see, it's a mixture of iterative and incremental. You incrementally uh, build uh, pieces, but inside of the of every um 
in, instead of every iteration, you are incrementing that iteration, let's say, okay? I hope it makes sense. So, in our case, um, I actually don't know how to start. Maybe we could start addressing two important problems. First of all, how do I model in the logic an array of to-dos and the interactions with the array of to-dos? And secondly, how to display all the things that I'm creating uh, on, on a web page? Let's start with the web page because I think it, it's more satisfying. So I'm going to create a new file here in array methods and I'm going to call it to do's HTML. This will be my web application. To do's HTML. And as you know, because this is lesson 20 starting from zero, so this is the 21st lesson. We did a lot of HTML, we did a lot of CSS, we also did some Git and some command line. We even had one of the students who suggested to write all the boilerplate of the HTML with just one exclamation mark and leaving the rest to Visual Studio Code. You have everything already available to you by just pressing exclamation mark and enter and you have all this thing. But if you don't use Visual Studio Code or you're not used to abbreviations, you just need to create a, the preamble, doc type HTML, and then the HTML must have a head and a body. What you put in the head is not really that important. What you put in the body is actually more important. So in the body, I'm going to create something that reminds a little bit of the to-do list. And this will start being static, completely static. So in the body, I want to create two parts of the application. Three parts. Let's also do the, the title. So how do you do the title? H1. To-dos. That's it. This is the first part. Very good. Then the second part is the form. We can create a form and the form can also have a button, but this form doesn't have a button. You can just press enter. How is it possible? Well, because in HTML, this is something that I didn't tell you probably, but in HTML forms, if you only have one text input, you can submit the form by pressing enter. You don't need a, a, a submit button. You can add a submit button, but you're not forced to. So we can do it the same way. We can create a form and the form has an input of type text and specifying that the type is text is actually not really that important because uh, every input by default has a type text unless otherwise specified, for example, type number. So type text, if you want, you can add it or you just remove it and that's fine. Um, I see what needs to be done. So this is a placeholder. I'm going to put it here. Placeholder is what needs to be done exclamation mark and i think that for now we're good yeah probably i don't know this will be the form and then under the form i have a list of to do's and this list of to do's well, i will represent it as a ul as an unordered list the unordered list has multiple list items, li. And in here, I'm just going to hard, hard code some values. So learn JavaScript, then seek for a job, and then forget everything. Okay, you can put whatever you want. You can also write to do one, to do two, to do three, that's fine. If this page works, I can try and see it on the live server. You remember the old live server? We probably stopped using live server something like 10 lessons ago, but this is probably the right moment to wrap everything up. I told you this is a special lesson. It's lesson number 20 on the 20th of March. So let's do something special in this special occasion. So how do I open the live server on this page? If I remember correctly, I go to the file system. I have to have 
the live server installed as an extension of course so if you don't have live server already just go here i'm saying this especially for my new one two two followers hi new two followers alexit lab and tiga biscuit um happy to see you i hope you're not confused by the amount of things that we are doing right now but this is as you can see it's not the first lesson so we had a whole uh path that we are even going to close at a certain point not not soon no i don't know but it's going to we're going to more than more towards the end than towards the beginning and then we'll start again next year so we've got the to do's and now if you have the live server um, installed you can probably right click and do open with live server and this ooh, this opens this thing here which is pretty big on my side but you probably see it very small but this is because i usually do a control plus enough times to see it nicely looking okay you know what i i i thought it was much worse i i thought it was really worse looking than than expected well, this is already fine but it's static so i don't like static things i want to animate this web application i want to make it work somehow so the first thing that i'm going to do is to also add at the end of the body we usually put this inside of the body. I'm going to add a script. A script with a source, which is a reference to the todos.js that we have still to create. Uh, well, we created the todos.js, but we haven't uh, put any, any code inside of it, right? So now the web page is also referring to some JavaScript. And if we did our job well, we can go, for example, in the todo.js application and do a console log of uh, hello world, as always. And if I go back to my page, if I open the developer tools and go to the console, it says hello world, which looks promising. It looks like the script is now going to work on my web page. Is it fine? Too fast? Too slow? Down low? Going back to the code, so you are able to read everything and even copy all, all fine, awesome, awesome. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is to model, it's okay, awesome. So the first thing that I want to do is to model an array of to-dos and try to attach those to-dos inside of the page. So, nothing really new here. I'm going to create a variable, let to-dos, and this variable is an array. This array will contain, well, can contain just some strings of text, but since I want to do peculiar things on these strings, I'm actually going to create objects for every to-do. A to-do will have, it usually has an ID, a unique identifier, and sometimes those IDs are just numbers, progressive numbers, one, two, three, four. Sometimes those IDs instead are auto-generated strings. They are called something like UUIDs. Um, it depends a lot on the technology that you are using. For example, if those to-dos are stored in a relational database, then most of the times the ID will be um, auto-generated and it's a number that gets auto-incremented. If you're using instead another database such as MongoDB, a document-oriented database, in that case the ID will be uh, similar to a string and this string will be something strange like, uh, like this. Okay, it has a strange shape, it's not human readable, and we don't care about this right now. Let's do ID. So a to-do has an ID, it has a text, and I'm going to create the same elements that I created on the HTML. So learn JavaScript, 
and this is the first one. And I also want to add a property uh, that I will, call, I will call done. And done is a Boolean property, and it will tell me if uh, the to-do is done or not. In this case, learn JavaScript will say it's true. And this is my first to-do in the array of to-dos. And then I can create another to-do and even another one. So, for example, I can create another to-do which has an ID of 2. The text, not the test, the text is seek for a job. And this one is false. And this is my second to-do. And then I can have a third to do, which is ID three. And the text is forget everything. And here again, I can do done false, or I can even experiment what happens if I don't have a property, if the property is undefined, will this break my code or will it not? I would say that I should do my best not to break the code if I don't have a property like this one. Okay, we've got the array of to-dos. Now, what I would like to do is, given the array of to-dos, try to create or generate this list of items dynamically instead of having them hard-coded in the HTML. This is my first, my first objective. Let's say that these to-dos are taken from a database or these to-dos are taken from um, some web storage. These to-dos are taken from some external service. So they are dynamic, they can be changed. I could add a new to-do, I could remove a to-do, I could change the state of one of those to-do, uh, to-dos. In, in fact, done could become true instead of false, or uh, it could become true instead of uh, undefined. And I want the interface to reflect those changes here, not have them hard-coded in the HTML. I don't want to just change the code every single time I change something uh, in my in, in, in my state, right? I want the computer to do this for me. So how do I interact with the HTML parts? Uh, there is one set of slides, as you can see, which is JS browser, which we haven't covered. And I'm not going to cover probably this set of slides because I don't want to teach you one by one what you can do with the browser. I don't think it's important. Well, I think that what is important is instead to find the information ourselves on Google. Because now you've got all the tools you need to learn how to learn. So we don't need to learn by heart how to interact with the browser. We need to learn how to look on the internet for the information that we need and how to apply that information successfully. For example, some, uh, some time ago, Bobby found out the document.write. Was it like this? And this did something, but it was a bit destructive. It was as destructive as saying, if I do document write to do's, this is what happens. Uh, we see an array of objects here which doesn't make too much sense. But it's a way to interact with the document, with the current web page. And it's writing, it's appending this array of to-dos stringified somehow at the end of the document. That's why we see this. We want to do something similar, actually. But we don't want to do it with document write. Maybe we can do something like this. Instead of having all these LIs hard-coded inside of the UL, I'm going to remove them and the UL starts empty. Let's see what happens if we start with the UL empty. I also have to remove the document, right? Okay, this is the current situation. There is a UL. There is probably UL. I cannot see it, but there is... Okay, here it is. It's uh, empty. 
but you can see that it has a margin it has some orange uh, spacing that's the margin so there is a ul and the ul is completely empty i want to fill this ul with all the elements that i have here but the elements i should also transform them somehow into some li's because this is not an html element this is a javascript object so i need a way to transform this h this javascript object into the html uh, list item and this is probably not that difficult let's try this thing here so if i start with the to do's and I want from the array of to-dos to create instead the LIs, the list items in HTML that we want to attach to the UL, to the unordered list, then I can probably use map. Because for every item in the array of to-dos, I can create something else. For every to-do in the array, I'm going to do something I'm going to return the results of some transformation of the current to-do. The transformation could be, for example, a string like this one, an li, a template literal, which contains the text of the to-do. You see how we are now mixing every single concept that I showed you, all those things together. Now we have arrays, arrays of objects, objects that can be accessed through dot notation, arrays that can be iterated with an array method, an array method that uses a callback function, and this callback function is an arrow function. And this arrow function takes whatever is the text of the current to-do and interpolates into a template literal, into a template string. Everything is mixed together. But as you can see, we couldn't arrive to this situation if I didn't tell you anything about arrays, object, uh, interpolation of strings, um, the array map method, uh, arrow functions, callback functions, etc. So that's why I had to wait so much before showing you some real life scenarios. I'm sorry for that, but as I told you, JavaScript, just like uh, any language that you can learn, even human language, requires you to start learning the grammar, the fundamentals, then you start building some uh, very easy sentences, maybe some sentences that you cannot even use in the real world, or maybe sentences like, uh, where is the next bus stop? And then finally, once you have everything in place, or at least most of the things in place, you can start writing a book like we are doing right now. Uh, it will be a very simple book. Well, it's actually a complicated book because we don't have the tools to make it simple. But it allows us to, to use this th these things effectively. Uh, I'm speaking and speaking because I'm taking, uh, um, yeah, I'm taking my time to to allow you to write all these things. So, what what is the result of this? Let's find out. I'm going to do a console log of this. And if I look on the console, I see an array of three LIs. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I have an array of three LIs. I would love to have these three LIs pasted inside of my HTML. And how do I do this? Well, the HTML can be, um, can be incremented by placing some strings. One other thing that I would like to do is also to not have an array of strings, but just have one huge string that I can append inside of my document. So something like um, dot join, oops, empty string. What is dot join empty string? I have an array of to-dos. I'm turning it into an array of strings 
I want to turn this array of strings into one whole string with everything on the same line. Or I can join with a backslash n so it will look a little better probably. Let's see what happens. Oh, this is nice. If I instead join not without a backslash n, uh, all the LIs are on the same line and it's actually pretty difficult to read, at least on the console, but I don't care about the console. So this is fine. I can join them with a backslash n if I want them to be readable for me, the developer, or I can join them with an empty string as a separator, which allows me to have them just all tied together in the same line. Now that I have this array, this whole string, I want to attach it. How do I do this? Well, I can use the Bobby method. For example, what happens if I do document.write the result of this? Whoa! <laughs> it looks well. It looks good. It looks pretty well, but it's not exactly what I want. In fact, if I look at this, I see that the LIs were appended at the end of the body, right below the script. And I wanted to put those li inside of the ul, because the ul, the unordered list, is the proper parent for list items. I should not put list items outside of a ul. So document write already gives you one result, which you can also already enjoy somehow. But I would probably try to make it better by trying to place those li's right inside of the UL. How do I do this? Well, first of all, I need to get a reference to that UL so I can paste things inside of it. How do I get a reference to an element in JavaScript? I can study thoroughly or I can ask Google. How do I get an element from the DOM in JavaScript? Okay, apparently there are multiple ways. There is document.getElementById if you have an idea. For example, if you have a div with an ID, then you can do document.getElementById given that ID. And that's already fine. We could use that. Oh, you can also get elements by class name. But in this case, as you can see, it's elements, not element because the ID is unique in a page, but class names, classes, could be multiple. For example, these divs have both the same class, demo. And that's why the ID is used for unique elements, while classes are used for multiple elements that share the same features. So in this case, you can do document.getElements by class name demo, which will give you Two, an array of two elements. Actually, if I remember correctly, this is not really an array, but let's just forget about that. It's still something that is iterable. As you can see, it will give you an array of two elements. Um, is there another way? Ooh, get elements by tag name. So instead of referring to an ID or instead of referring to the class of the element, you can just refer to the tag. For example, these are two articles, and here you can get all the elements that have the tag name article. So you don't even need an ID or a class. And then, this is a new feature, you've got these two methods, which I hate, at least I hate their names, query selector and query selector all. Why do I hate the name? Because, as you can see, those are methods of the object called document. And as I already told you, a function, and especially a method, should have a naming convention that is a verb in imperative way. This should be something like select elements, or query the document, I don't know, do something. Instead, this method seems like an object, query selector. This is a selector by query. Why should we have something like this? I, uh, many years ago, I used to deal with, uh, with some JavaScript maps, 
like Google Maps, but I had to integrate maps from another provider, which was not Google. And I hated the fact that there was this object called map in which I could remove a point like this because there was such a method that was remove point. But when you, add, when you had to add a point, it was point adder. And it made me cringe so much. Why a point adder? It should be add point. If you have remove point, you should have, you should have add point. I hate this kind of uh, inconsistency in code. This goes against the principle of least astonishment or the principle of least surprise, which is something that I really, really care about and nobody out there cares about enough for me. When you design your code you, uh, and you're also your interfaces, you should always try to surprise the user of your code or your interface as few as possible. The user should never be surprised by your interface. They should feel at home. That's why my main motto is it's all a matter of front end because it, every, it, the, one of the most important things in, in life is how you pose yourself to the others. And the same goes with code. Uh, you have to focus on how it works internally, of course. It's a really, really important, but you should never forget also the other side of, 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 the, of this aspect. You should also take care of how your implementation is shown to the users, because those users will have to use your code, your interface, and they should feel at home. So, Query Selector, although it's an ugly name, but it's a very nice addition to JavaScript, because finally these two methods allow you to, uh, to just avoid the need for a library called jQuery. In fact, there is a website called something like you might not need jQuery, which is a, a nice website that explains you that jQuery is a very, very important library, widely used nowadays, still widely used. But right now, you probably don't need it anymore. If you're creating new projects, you can probably start your projects without ever using jQuery. Why is that? Because jQuery addressed multiple, uh, multiple features that were not available in older browsers. But now, JavaScript is much more powerful than before, and more, many things that you used to do with jQuery, you can now do them natively with plain JavaScript. Not thinking that if you're using instead a framework like Vue.js, Angular, or React, you really, really don't need jQuery. In fact, jQuery will probably even get on your way because it doesn't fit well with those frameworks. So this is a very nice web page that shows you things that you could do with jQuery and then that you can now do with plain JavaScript. Uh, there are many things that we never saw, so I'm not going to show them to you. But one of them, for example, is, oh, where is that? Yep. You had the ability to select an element from the DOM in jQuery with this syntax here, but now you can use query selector all. That's it. That's the only thing that I wanted to show. So we're not going to use jQuery. We're going to use the... Uh, the new methods that we have in in documents. We could use query selector, query selector role, or we could even use those other methods that I showed you. These are still available. Get elements by tag name, get elements by class name, or even get elements by ID, which will get you just one element if you specify an ID. I think that we could use this one for starters. Yep, why not? So we need to add an ID. We, we need to have the UL specifying an ID. And I will call this one uh, list, okay? Now the UL can be referred by ID. We already saw that the ID can be used in CSS to specify some CSS properties, some CSS rules that we want to apply on this element. But the ID is also useful in JavaScript when you want to get that element and do something with it, manipulate the element. So now that we've got the ID on the UL, 
we have to keep in mind exactly what is the name list all lowercase no uppercases let's remember that this should be exactly this one and now I can have a new reference here to that ul by saying something like this let ul is equal to document I'm asking the document object to get an element by its id and here I have to write exactly the ID that I specified in the HTML. Does Prettier and ESLint also check the HTML files, says Angelo? So it depends. Um, Prettier, yes, if you ask him nicely. I mean, Prettier formats our JavaScript files, but Prettier is also able to format our HTML files. And in my case, I think I have Prettier already formatting my HTML file. How did I do this? I don't remember, but I think I did something like this. I did Control Shift P or in, in for Max Command Shift P and I said format document. And the first time you ask this thing, if you have other formatters installed in Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code will ask you, hey, what formatter should I do, should I use? Is it prettier or is it another one? I already made this decision so if I press enter here it doesn't do anything and the decision is saved in my settings so if I do control comma now and I go to the JSON version of my file I will see that in this place I'm, I already specified that for HTML my default formatter will be no not prettier <laughs> I'm using another one I'm using the um, the native v Visual Studio Code language features of HTML. But I can choose another thing. In fact, I can remove this option and I'll do it again. I'm going to format the document. What am I doing? I'm going to format the document, Control Shift P, format document. And he's asking me, hey, but there are multiple formatters for dust files. This is not a dust file, but uh, okay. Configure. And it's asking me, hey, do you want to use Prettier or do you want to use the HTML language features? I'm going to use Prettier this time. And now the code is formatted slightly differently. I don't know if you see the difference, but now head and body are indented a little more because they are children of HTML, which makes sense. But if I use the other formatter, so I'm going to remove this one and I'm going to do it again. Hey, please format my document. But this time I'm going to specify the HTML language features. You will see that head and body are not indented more than HTML. They are at the same level of indentation of HTML. And they also have some separation here between the head and body and between the body and the HTML. And for some reason, I prefer this a little better. Because, yes, it's true, head and body are children of HTML, but it is pretty obvious and I prefer to have one fewer, one less level of indentation. It makes my code a little more readable. So, yes, Prettier can be used for, to format your, uh, your elements, but it can also, but any other formatter can also be used. What about ESLint? I don't remember, but I can create a script here and say let a is equal to two, 1. And since a was never used, I would have probably expected uh, ESLint to tell me that a was declared but never used. But maybe this is also because a is a global variable. What happens if I put it in a function? Okay, I've got, no, this is a, this is an, a JavaScript error. Let's say function hello. Okay, I don't see ESLint working on this code. Maybe I should ask him nicely. Uh, for example, lint. Hmm. Nope. I don't see anything here that reminds me of linting my script in the HTML. Uh, ESLint since it's called ESLint, it stands for ECMAScript Lint. So ESLint is going to only lint my JavaScript code. It's not going to lint my HTML. I think so. What if I 
mess up my form. I didn't close my form. Nothing is, no one is complaining, as you can see. It's wrong, but no one is complaining. So watch out because no, nobody is checking for your HTML code apparently. Maybe there is an HTML lint. Yeah, there are some linters for HTML. Maybe I can even find an extension. HTML lint. Okay, we've got some packages. Uh, HTML CSS support, but this is just IntelliSense. This is not linting. What about HTML slip snippets? Formatter, preview. I don't see an HTML linter here. Oh, HTML lint. Not really that used. Yeah, used used a bit. Yep. If you want, you can lint your files with one of these uh, extensions. Uh, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so now we've got a UL. This should be a reference to our list, to our unordered list. And I think that this could be called a const because I'm not going to change this list. At least I'm not going to change the reference to the current list. What happens if I console log this one? Let's see what we have um, here in the console. Ooh, okay. <laughs> it shows it as the list. So right now I'm pretty sure that I, I am successfully referring to that unordered list. Is it the same for you? I hope so. Check your code during the coffee break. Let's do a quick coffee break five minutes from now. See you at 12.06 my time. Bye, see you later.
a few moments later. Here I am again. How is it going? Everything fine? Uh, are you having any problems with the UL? I had problem with cold, so I had to put uh, my usual, how's it called this one? The sweater? The, I don't know, my hoodie? No, the hoodie has a, has a cap and this doesn't have it. Okay, so I hope you're uh, still alive and happy with the current results. Let's continue. So apparently I did document dot get, element, get element by ID, given the ID that I specified in the HTML. And when I print this UL, I actually see this thing here. It's the graphical representation of that uh, element, of that HTML element, which is fine. Uh, this is a convention that I only do. I didn't see it anywhere, but I think it's better. When I'm referring to elements in the DOM, I usually call them starting with a dollar in front of them. Why dollar? Well, first of all, because you probably saw it, jQuery as, um, as a library uses a lot this uh, dollar symbol. In fact, jQuery, when you install it as a library, creates this uh, global variable called dollar to which you can ask whatever you want. So if, since we're not using jQuery, I'm stealing this convention and using the dollar symbol for every variable that refers to an HTML document, uh, to an HTML element. So this will visually tell me immediately the difference between the variable called to-dos, which is part of my application, and the variable called ul, which is instead part of the DOM, of the document. Okay, so this is just my way of doing it. So, instead of document writing this thing here, I want to append these elements, these list items, to this element here, to the ul. I want to take the ul, and fill it with LIs. So the next question is, how? How, uh, how do I uh, append elements in JavaScript? Okay, there is something called append child, but probably it's not exactly what I want. Let's see. Here it creates a node, which is the result of creating an element called li and then I create a text node and then I append the text node as a child of the node and finally if I have a list I append this child node to the list. So this is very very procedural. I'm instead of declaring the shape of the li as a string. This is creating the element called li. It's putting some text inside of it by appending the text as a child of the li. And then it's appending all the li that we created so far to the ul. This is fine, but it seems like a lot of work. Is there any way, other way I can do this? Uh, maybe using the strings that we created. Probably there is a way and uh, we could find it somewhere. Or, ooh, what is this? Inner HTML. Hmm, love this. If I get one element from the DOM, apparently I can replace all of its content with some string. And if I remember well, this content can be just a text or it can be some HTML since it's called inner HTML. So this is probably what we want. Um, I'm not seeing any interesting uh, examples here, but from experience, I know that this can be uh, the, the good one. So instead of document writing, I'm going to remove the document right here. I have to do's map, but the result of these to do's map will be stored as the inner HTML 
of this list. So I'm going to say $UL dot inner HTML is equal to whatever is the result of this map and join. And inner HTML requires some text. That's why I'm also joining the array. Because if I'm placing an array of strings, I don't know what happens. Well, I probably can expect this array to be converted automatically into a string and then appended into the HTML. But it will probably add some extra commas. So I don't want to do that. If you're curious about what I'm saying, I will show it to you, don't worry. So let's do it for, for now like this. We have a reference to the list and then to this list, I'm asking, hey, you know your inner HTML, it's empty right now, but I'm going to replace it with the result of this computation here. If I save the file and go back to my document, Sorry, was late. Why did we put the dollar sign before the UL? Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, it's just a convention that I use, but it's just my convention. I didn't use it um, anywhere else, but since jQuery as a library uses the dollar extensively, and we are not using jQuery, I decided to steal this convention of using a dollar from jQuery, and this will allow me to better differentiate between variables that refer to some uh, document elements uh, and differentiate them from uh, instead variables that refer to my application. So you can call it UL and that's fine, but I prefer calling it $UL because it's, it shows immediately that I'm not referring to any kind of object. I'm referring to a reference to an HTML element. And then I'm also doing this. I found out that the UL or any HTML element has this property, inner HTML, which I can uh, inspect and I can also uh, change. So it's an object with a property that I can set. And in this case, the new value for inner HTML is whatever comes from this expression here, to do's map, blah, blah, blah. And what happens is very similar to what we had before, at least externally, but internally it's better because now the LIs are placed inside of the list, exactly where we want it. Nice. You know what? This is the usual arrow function that does one thing and that one thing is returning an element. Uh, returning the, the results in expression. So I can even remove, as always, the curly braces and the return statement, and this becomes even shorter. It can even become a one-liner, like in this case. But it will not become a one-liner anymore as soon as I do another thing. The other thing that I want to do is this. I want to visually show the to-dos that are completed, the to-dos that are done. Right now, the to-dos all look the same. And I want to see the done to-do, the completed one, with a strike through the text, with a line through. So how can I do this? Well, again, uh, I would probably solve this problem step by step, very slowly, starting from um, a hard-coded, simple example, and then trying the dynamic part, uh, the dynamic way. So, you know what? I'm going to comment out this thing. So now the UL is empty again. And in the to-do's HTML, I'm going to create again, a list of items that I will remove as soon as possible. So this is the completed one and this is the to be done one. I want to visually differentiate those two LIs. Right now they are static, they are in the HTML and I cannot tell the difference between those two, right? 
So how do I tell the difference visually? Well, this is a matter of CSS and we know how to do CSS. We can add a class to the completed one. Why a class and not an ID? Well, because I could have more than one completed element and I want every completed element to behave the same. So this time I prefer to use a class instead of an ID because that could be multiple elements. So this will have a class of, uh, let's call it done or even completed if you want. Uh, I don't want to... Um, I don't want you guys to be confused between the done property that we have in the object and the done class that we have here. So, you know what? I'm going to call it completed here. Let's see what happens. I'm going to call it completed. Will this affect my HTML in any way? No, not at all. Not externally. But internally, I see that the first li has a class of completed and the second one does not. So this first item completed should be visually different from the other one. And probably the stupidest way I can visually uh, tell apart the completed one from the non-completed one is to add to this element some text decoration of line through. I usually do it like this. The completed now seems like a completed task because it has a line passing through it. But as you know, here I'm changing the style in a way that will not be persisted. I'm just changing the style of this LI temporarily and as soon as I refresh the page I lose everything. So this is just a, a small experiment that I can do and as, a, as soon as I'm happy with my results then I can persist the change. How do I persist the change? You already know how to do that, right? We can create a new file, which is a CSS file. So I'm going to call it uh, new file to do's.css. In the file, I can provide that same property as specified for all of the elements of class completed. All of the elements of class completed will have text decoration equal to line through. I'm going to stop here for now. I know that sometimes I go too slow, uh, too, too fast, so I'm slowing down and giving you the time. We are doing some rehearsal of CSS. Long time no see CSS, old pal. Hope it's fine for you. In the meantime, I see a new follower, Mendo Dude. Hi, Mendo Dude. Thanks for, uh, for the follow. Hope you enjoy. So, the CSS has this class completed, and text decoration is line through for every completed item. Will this change the behavior here? If I refresh, nothing changes. What is missing? I'm asking you guys. Is it enough to add a class to the element and specify the rules for that element? S referencing the HTML for the CSS file, says Bobby. Sourcing the CSS, says Tiago. Angelo says link between HTML and CSS files. Sal says the link. And all of the most interacting uh, students that I have in the channel said the correct answer. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, we cannot just create a CSS, we have to link it, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we have to link it in the HTML. And usually this link is performed in the head, because we want this uh, CSS to be executed even before the body will be executed. So yes, correct. <coughs> and thanks also to to that kid 12, 12, 18 for spamming again uh, on the followers. So let's ban the user. Spam bot. Banning by T that kid 12, 12, 18. But thanks for passing by. Okay, so <clears throat> the head will also add a link. What kind of link? 
it, this is actually very difficult for me to all re or to remember. So I'm asking help to Emmet. If I write link without specifying the uh, opening tag, luckily Emmet is giving me many suggestions. And the suggestion that I prefer is this one here, link colon CSS. If I select this one, ooh, okay, this is exactly what I wanted and I didn't remember how to write it, but style CSS is not the proper name. I have to write to do's CSS because I, I called it like this. And now that I have this link, oh, okay, now the CSS is actually uh, applied to my elements, okay? Good, so now that this thing works in static HTML, I want this to work only also on dynamic HTML. So I'm going to remove these LIs, which were just an experiment to see statically how things work, and I can remove it completely. I have, again, the empty list, and I go back to the JavaScript where I uncomment my inner HTML code. And in here, this is where I want to add the class. And I have to do some, probably some calculations here. Um, those calculations could be a little complicated to do in the same line. So we can split those calculations in multiple lines if you want to, or we can try create the, all these calculations in here. I would say that the li should have a class. And this class, is not always completed. In fact, if I say completed here, what happens is that now every single to-do seems to be completed. Even if some to-dos are not completed. In fact, there's just one to-do that is completed. I want this class to be applied only when the property done of the to-do is true. Because if the property done is false or it doesn't even exist, then I don't want to add this class completed. So this class will be dynamic. It's not hard-coded. It will be the result of some JavaScript expression that I'm going to write here. And this JavaScript expression is usually something like this. If to do dot done, so if the property done of the current to do in the iteration is true, so I can say is true, or I can just say to do dot done, which already gives me true if the to do is done, then ternary operator, I will return from this JavaScript expression the completed string. Otherwise, I can just return an empty string if I want to, or probably can even re return null or uh, undefined, but I'm not really sure what will happen. So let's try. Let's try and see what happens. I'm going to return an empty string if the do is if the to do is not done. Like this. If this seems difficult to read and you have to scroll up and down or left and right, remember template literals allow you to go to a new line. And there's no shame in doing that. In fact, sometimes it's even more readable to do it like this. So I'm going to put everything on a new line in the template literal and this is still going to work because template literals allow for interpolation of JavaScript expressions but also allow for new lines, multi-line strings. So if I go now here, ooh, this seems promising. I see learn JavaScript which has a class of completed and it has a lot of more blank space here but I don't care since uh, it shows well. And the other one, the other ones have a class which is empty. Not really nice, but it works. The class is empty. That's fine. What happens if I, instead of the empty string, I give null? Oh, class null. This is bad. I wouldn't put null. Even if it works, but this means that there should be a class called null in the CSS, which is not really that nice. What about undefined? Oh, class undefined. No, I don't like that either. So not going to use null or undefined. What about false? Class false. Okay, probably the best solution is either creating an empty string here, or we can do another thing. 
since we if we don't want to have the class to be shown even if empty I can try to change this code a little bit and uh, twist it around maybe do something like this if the to do is done then I'm going to return the whole class equals to completed otherwise I'm going to return nothing and this should probably do the trick now I have the li completed but all the other li's do not even specify the class but this is just if you really really care about removing that empty class attributes in the li otherwise you just don't care I'm going to put everything as before and this is completely fine maybe one day you want the class to be uncompleted and you're already in the, in the correct situation it will be easier for you to add a class for the non-completed items so why not keep it like this okay so this is already a good uh, a good start right we are starting to create an application that given any number of to do's that are retrieved from a database or stored in local storage or whatever it's able to show a different uh, screen based on those to do's and now we're going to make things a little more difficult because I want to also interact with this application by writing something here and as soon as I press enter this thing should become a to do that I see here on the list at the bottom of the list will it be difficult probably yes the first thing that I want to do is to get access to this form because once I get a reference to the form I can interact with it and I can do it the same way as before I can put an ID to the form or if you want to you can use the other uh, methods of document which is uh, uh, query selector or query selector all and that's also fine I just want you to not be confused so I'm going to, 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 to explain it a little thoroughly I want to create a new variable a constant because it's not going to change and I will call it dollar form because I want this to uh, specify the fact that we are referring to an HTML element it can be called form it can be called whatever whatevs but I prefer to call it form with the dollar because this way I remember what is this element and now I can ask document to do something for example get elements by tag name could be used I'm not going to use it but if I wanted to use it get elements by tag name just give you uh, I'm just going to pass form because the tag name of the form is form is the name of the tag form but as the method specifies, as the name specifies, this gives me more than one element because you could have multiple forms in the same document and this will in fact return not just one form it will return a collection of multiple elements that correspond to this tag name even though the element in the page is just one but JavaScript doesn't know in advance so uh, and, and they don't want to know it in advance so they will give you an array containing all the possible elements that match this sort of query and the element is one it will be an array with one element let's let's have a look at it if I do console log of uh, dollar form I will see in the console log that this is an HTML collection containing one element what is an HTML element uh, HTML collection I don't really care about that it's uh, similar to an array but it's probably is slightly different and this is actually I think a problem that we used to have in JavaScript because you are referring to array to collections of elements but they are not arrays so they behave sometimes like arrays but sometimes they do not and this is quite confusing one thing that JavaScript uh, the jQuery as a library did really really well is to instead 
uh, abstracts this thing and give you just arrays of elements instead of HTML collections of elements. So we don't care about the fact that this is an HTML collection, not an array. If it contains one element, I can say something like, hey, you know this uh, collection? Give me the element at index zero. Or if you like destructuring, you can say, hey, you know this collection? I know that it contains one element, so I'm going to destructure it into its own child, which is form. And as you can see now, it shows you just the form. But as I told you, I probably don't want to use get elements by tag name. Probably there's a better way. One better way, for example, let's remove these square brackets, is to use get, nope, is to use query selector. I already told you that there are two new methods in JavaScript. They are called query selector and query selector all. Query selector all will accept a string that will provide you all the elements that satisfy this query. And in this case, it's a node list of forms, even different from the HTML collection, but it still looks a lot like an array. But it's a node list, whatever this means. So this behaves very, very similar to the get elements by tag name. But if you do query selector, it means that you are sure that you will retrieve only one element and you're interested in that only element. And this will give you just the form itself without the need of destructuring or getting the first element by yourselves. You could be confused between these two. <clears throat> these are actually pretty, pretty different. <clears throat> For example, uh, what you see here as form this is actually a CSS selector, and this is why it's called query selector. Form, written like this, is just like in CSS saying, hey, the element that has tag name form. In fact, in this method here, query selector, you could even use IDs and classes. You can say, hey, you know the element with ID list? This is what I want to be retrieved. Or, you know the element that has a class of completed? This is the element that I want to retrieve. As you can see, I'm using CSS syntax here. So if I say completed, this is the tag name. And we don't have a tag name called completed. If I do this, this is an element that has a class of completed. And if I do this, I'm looking for an element that has an ID completed. Okay? So here, if I say query selector form, I'm getting all the elements, well, the first element, the only element that has a tag name of form. If I want to use this same exact query selector here, I have to pay attention because get element by ID knows that this is an ID. So you don't need to specify the hash symbol. But if I use query selector, this is a whole different matter and I have to specify the hash because query selector can accept any kind of CSS selector. And in this case, I want to check the element which has an ID of list. If I do this, it's going to look for a tag with a name list, which is not what we want. Query selector and query selector all are the new ways of querying the DOM, which doesn't mean that you should always replace the document.getElementById or the document get elements by tag, tag name, etc., etc., with this. But you have this choice. And in order to have uh, multiple flavors at the same time, I'm going to revert back to get element by ID here and use query selector form in here, just to have these two at the same time. Okay? So apparently the form is there. And now I can do something with the form. Awesome. What should I do with a form? Everything's fine? Hope so. Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. So what should I do with a form? Yes, says also, also so, awesome. Okay, so what do I want to do with a form? The form will uh, has an input, 
and probably I should also have a reference to that input. So yeah, probably I should also create a reference to that input because I want to get whatever is written inside of this input. Because the text of this input will be the text of the new to do, right? Um, so I probably need the also the text. But another thing that I want to uh, address is the fact that when I press enter, the form is submitted. And look what happens. Okay, it w there was a flash, and now we've got the question mark here, which wasn't uh, present at first. There was a there's a new thing here, a question mark. So, what is happening right now? Well, originally, forms used to behave like this. When I submit a form, this is going to perform a request to a server. The server is going to respond with uh, a new web page, and I'm going to show the new web page here. All the parameters, all the texts, and all the values that I have in the inputs of my form will be uh, passed as parameters uh, to the server. The server will process these parameters and will return a new web page. But this was in web 1.0. We are actually in one web 2.0, or probably even 3.0, and nowadays, we don't use forms like this anymore. We process everything on the client and we stay in the same page. We are doing single page applications. So pages that stay there and their content changes on the fly without me needing to refresh the page or even go to a new page every single time I, I click on something. Nowadays, it would be pretty stupid. Tiago, the new input will enter the array in the last position. Yes, exactly. This is what I want. If I write something and I press enter, I want this text to be shown here in the last position of the array. Exactly. Um, okay. A lot of spam calls I see on, on the chat. Uh, not on the chat, on, on, not on Twitch, on other programs. Uh, okay. So, first things first. I have to somehow intercept the submission of the form and uh, avoid this behavior that is created by default of trying to go to a new page or even refreshing the page. I don't want to refresh the page. I want it to stay there. So first of all, I'm going to attach an event handler to the form. The form right now is able to submit but I want to intercept the submission and handle the event of submission in a, in a certain way. So, how to handle events on the DOM in JavaScript? Oh, there seems to be a really nice way called add event listener, but this is not the only way. There were also old ways which are now probably deprecated. Uh, for example, there was a way which I hate, which is right in the HTML, you can write on click of a button, for example, and you specify the function. The reason why I hate specifically this way is that as you can see, it's really, really confusing because I'm passing a in a string the invocation of the function which I think is pretty stupid. I always told you that you should pass a reference to a function. And here instead, I'm passing a string with, which looks like invoking the function itself. Uh, I think this is horrible. And in fact, nowadays we don't do this anymore at all. There's another way. Uh, I, I'm still showing you this because instead, when you use a framework like React, React uses a similar syntax, which makes more sense, but it's very similar to this one. Um, there's another way, another old way, and we already saw this one. You can get the button, for example, with query selector, and then you attach a function expression to the onClick property. This is also cool. You can use that. 
But there's also a new way, which I don't even remember if it's better or why is it better. And it's a method called add event listener. If you use add event listener, you attach this event listener to the specific element. So target is the element, is the form, for example. And to the form, you ask to add an event listener for some specific kind of event. And this is a string. What event you would like to listen to? Is it the click of the button? Is it the drag of an element? Is it the submit of the form? Or is it the hover on some input? There are multiple types of events that you can listen to. And the listener here is the callback function that will be invoked as soon as this event occurs, which is something that we started seeing uh, a few lessons ago. I gave you a sneak peek of how buttons behave. Now we're going to use it with forms. So I can ask the form to add an event listener and add an event listener requires at least two parameters. One is the string which describes the, the type of event that I want to listen to. And the type of event that I want to listen to is called submit, on submit of the form, when the form is submitted. And the second parameter is the callback function, which I usually write as an arrow function. I'm not forced to, but arrow functions are so nice to see. So yeah, I'm going to use an arrow function in this case too. Event listeners usually invoke these, uh, sorry, uh, the add event listener method usually invokes this callback function passing at least one parameter here, which is called the, which is the event being triggered right now. This is an object, the event, uh, you can call it like you want, you can call it E. Sometimes I see it as E, but I like to be explicit. I will call it event. And the event is an object that um, has multiple properties and multiple methods too. The first method that we want to immediately invoke is strangely enough called like this event dot prevent default event dot prevent default what is this this is a, a method that i always invoke on submit of a form and this is probably all almost the only situation in which i call this method and as the name says, it prevents the default behavior of submitting the form. So if I know that the form by default submits, which means that it refreshes the page or it goes to another page, then I want to prevent that. I want to avoid this behavior. And event.preventDefault will actually do exactly this. If I now submit the form, it stays here. It doesn't do that jump. It doesn't refresh the page. So this is already pretty good. And if I want to see what, it, what else the event is able to do, I can do a console log right now of this event. And let's see what it contains. So whenever I submit the form, it will prevents the default behavior, and then it will print the event of submission. Let's see, I'm going to... Okay, it's uh, apparently a submit event, and it has lots of things. The type of the event is submit, okay. It has a timestamp, which probably means that this is the time when the event occurred. It also has a lot of uh, Boolean flags here. For example, bubbles or cancel bubble, cancelable, composed. B event bubbling means that sometimes there are multiple elements in the same hierarchy of components that could listen to the same event 
and you don't want this event to be triggered on the parent if the child already um, already handled this event. So when the event is uh, handled by the child and then also the parent handles that event, this is called event bubbling because the event bubbles up uh, to, the, to the parents, to the top of the hierarchy. And sometimes you don't want this to happen, so you avoid bubbling and you can do it with... Um, I think there is um, a method. What was that? Oh yeah, it's called... yeah, unfortunately it's not that... Not, it's not that good uh, sounding. It's called stop propagation. I would love to... I would have loved to have it called stop bubbling, but it's exactly the same. If the child gets the event and handles the event, you also want to ask event, please stop the propagation so the event is not bubbled upwards. Uh, but we don't care about event bubbling, at least for now, so we don't care about that. Um, we also got the target, and the target is a property in the event that is a reference to the current form that triggered the um, the event. So this is a reference to the same form that triggered the event and it has a lot of properties. So many. And we don't even care about all of that. Uh, you will probably learn some of them as soon as you need them. Usually I don't need all to know all these properties. So who cares about that? So we have the event now and we don't really care about the event right now. What we want instead is to add a new element to the array of to-dos. But before getting the element, before adding the element to the array of to-dos, we probably also need to get the text from the input. But this is already too much. So let's go step by step. Let's give for granted that I know the text. I hard code it right now. I don't want to get the text immediately. So I will say, you know what, the text is, I don't know, a string, new to do. Let's give for granted that I know how to get the text. I don't care about right now about how I retrieve the text from the text input. Let's say it was new to do. So what should I do right now? Well, I can push, todos.push, and I'm going to push a new object. A new object that will contain, uh, I should probably create a new ID, for example, ID 4, since the last ID is 3, then the new ID will be 4. Again, I'm hard coding values for now, and then I'm going to make them dynamic. But one thing that I really, really recommend you to do is to never try to solve everything together. Try to uh, fix some variables, you, you place them there, they are static, the text is static, the ID is static, the only thing that's changing is the array of to-dos because now it's going to have a new element inside of it. So I, I'm pushing in the array of to-dos a new object with an ID of 4, static, and the text of text, the text that I have here. And as you know, there is also a shorthand so instead of saying text colon text, I can even say just text. It's easier. Will this work? Seems like it should be working, but it's actually not. Or at least it doesn't show. If I now write something and I press enter, hmm. Nothing seems to be changed. Well, yes, something is changed. The to-dos array has this new element. And since I pressed enter multiple times, probably the to-dos array has a lot of these elements. But they don't show. Because I should also re-render the UL given the new value of the array of to-dos. Okay, so you know what? I'm going to do another thing now. 
I'm going to take this code here and I'm going to wrap it into a function that I will call render like this and now everything is broken I don't even see the initial to do's because I'm never invoking this function of course so we can do something like this we can invoke render here so it gets invoked at least once and then inside of the event listener once I pushed the elements in the, the new element in the array of to-dos I can call render again so the interface will be refreshed after I changed the state of my application right so we are we are defining a function render which will re-render every single time I invoke it the list of to-dos given the array that I have here and I render it once as soon as the application starts and then I also re-render every single time I submit a new to-do that's why we need functions because we can reuse them multiple times we are going to use the render function twice now at start and then at every submit what happens now is that now I see this thing here but if I write something I press enter okay I've got this one it's not something it's new to do because I hard-coded the text and if I press enter again and again and again and again it's going to add new elements so yeah it's kind of working we're getting closer and closer everything's good hope so too fast yes awesome <laughs> too fast too furious sorry had to oh yeah yeah you 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 must you must thanks a lot in fact just yesterday i was uh, i was playing with uh, need for speed uh, i don't remember which name uh, need for speed uh, it's not underground don't remember the one with the open world where you can drive freely and you can also participate to some races most uh, yeah most wanted i uh, yeah it, it's most wanted i'm actually pretty bad at that game i never tried even one race because i completely i always bang my my car i always crash my car everywhere uh, i even have the steering wheel the physical one which makes things better best nfs game in my opinion was so fun really okay i saw people complaining a lot about the controls because the controls are pretty pretty difficult um, but probably it's just people complaining because they are not good at games just like me <laughs> okay so we've got the double render and now we want to make things a little more dynamic right i think it has to do with nostalgia as well <laughs> oh i see so i want to for example i want to get the new text the real text okay i want to get the real text i want to see something not new to do how do i get the real text well first of all i can get a reference to the current input just like i create a reference to the current form maybe i can get a reference to the input and i do it like this const dollar input is equal to document dot query selector and i only have one input so i can do it like this if i want to it should work and in here where I see const text is equal to new to do I actually want to get the text that is stored inside of the input element but how do I get the text from an input element in JavaScript oh wait a second Google how do I get the text of an input element in JavaScript? Why should I ask myself this thing when I can ask Google? Ooh, how to get the value of text input field using JavaScript? Oh, look at that. It seems that I can get an element by ID or whatever, 
and I can ask the property called value. That's it. Okay, it's called value. Okay, let's do it. So the text is not to do, new to do. The text is given the input, I will ask for the value. And it's a property, it's not, it's not a function, it's not a method. So input value. Will this work? Probably. Let's see. In my application now, I say something and I press enter. Ooh, it's something. And now something else. Yep, it's working. The only thing that I don't like is that the text is here, uh, remains. I would like to um, empty this text as soon as I input a new to-do. Is there a way to uh, empty the value of an input text in JavaScript? Empty the value of an input text in JavaScript. How to clear input fields on focus? Well, that's too much already. Okay, this says on focus this dot value is equal to empty string. Mm, if I'm open-minded enough, I would say that the value property is a property that can be changed, not only retrieved, but also changed, just like the inner HTML. So maybe after I pushed the text, maybe I can also do something like, hey input, you know your value, just turn it into an empty string. And this is already fine, but you know what? I think that probably this would be better to put it in the render. Or maybe not. No, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it here. Okay, so if now everything works, I have this thing, I say something, I press enter, and that something is appended to the list of, uh, uh, of to-dos, but it's the text of the input is also cleared. Good. This is exactly what I wanted, right? Um, another thing that I hate about this interface is that I always have to click on the input every single time. But this is something that I can uh, uh, probably change in just in plain HTML. In fact, if I remember well, in the HTML, you can say that an input has an autofocus property. You don't even need to specify a value, just place it as autofocus. And now the input is already focused. So I say something, press enter, and it's still focused. So this will make my to-do list much more usable because I don't have to use my mouse. I don't have to click on the input in order to add anything. Very nice. There's still another thing, however, that is um, static and it's the ID. It's not important right now because we are not doing anything with the ID. For me, it's already like this, says Angelo. Okay, so you already got the autofocus in, even if you don't have autofocus here. Really? Okay. Nice. Um, I don't know why it doesn't, it's not like this for me. I'm going to remove autofocus and it's not focused. I have to, and now it's in autofocus. So probably, are you sure that it's in autofocus as soon as you start the application? Because it goes into autofocus as soon as I click at least once, but not the first time. Ah, oh, sorry, you know you're right. Oh, okay, okay. So autofocus means that you have the focus as soon as you start the application. Then once you got the focus, yes, you don't need to, uh, to select it again. Okay, so uh, I was talking about this ID. ID4 is not something that we are using right now. But for example, if we want to display it, we will see that there is some problems. Um, let's try to display this uh, ID. I'm going to display it here. I'm going to say that in the li, I'm going to show to do.id 
and then dash to do text. So I'm seeing one, two, and three. Okay, it's just a way to show it for no reason at all. And now when I say something, it has an idea of four. But if I say something else, mm, still idea of four. This is not possible. If you try to save these elements on a database, or if you're using a framework like React, those systems will complain because the ID is a unique identifier. It should be unique always. So we cannot have two items with the same ID. It's not really important right now because the ID is not used anywhere other than just showing it to the user. But trust me, it's important and you should always have a unique identifier which is completely different from other IDs. We will see this when we, if and when we do some React. So ID 4 is not what I want. The const ID now is 4, but I want to well, I want it to be calculated. I'm going to add some spacings here so they look a little better. So I'm preventing default that I'm doing this thing here, then I'm rendering. Also, I think that, yeah, probably this is more oriented towards the rendering part because I'm uh, changing the value of the input. But it's the same. So how do I calculate this ID? Um, you know how to do it. If you think about it, you can do it in a couple of ways. One way could be to have uh, some sort of global variable here that stores the value of the current ID. And then every time you create a new to-do, you just do ID++. And this is a way that databases create those auto-generating IDs. So they have the counter, the ID counter, and every time you create a new element in the database, they just increase that counter. But there's also another way, which is also another way to store IDs in the database, which is calculating the new ID based on the uh, maximum ID that you see in your current array. So you can say, what is the last element? It's this one. What is the ID of the last element? It's three. Then the next ID must be four. And I can just check the, the last element because if they are placed in order, you will never have something like this. You don't have one, three, two. You always have one, two, three. Even if you, remem if you remove an element from this array, the maximum ID will always be the last one. And if, and if I remove this one, well, the, now the, the maximum ID is still the last one. It's just do two and not three. So I could go and check the last element in the array of to-dos. I can check its ID and then I can do a plus one. And this is what I'm going to do here. Instead of saying four, I'm going to get the last element in the array. How do I get the last element in an array? I can say to-dos of... I have to get the last index. And the last index is always equal to the length of the to-dos array minus one. Because if an array has length three, the index of the last element is always two, right? Because we start counting from zero. Element zero, element one, element two. In an array of three elements, I've got an index of two. So I have to always subtract one in order to get the index of the last element. So now this to do's of to do's length minus one refers to this last element in the array. And about this element, I want to get the ID. And this is our maximum ID for now, to which I have to add a plus one which will give me four. And this should work every single time. Whenever I submit a new, uh, a new text, a new to-do, this calculation will be performed over and over again. So the ID will always increase. Is this going to work? Yes, but not always. Let's see. 
So far so good. I write something and it's four. I write something else and it's five. Good. Yep, seems to be working. But it doesn't always work. <clears throat> Do you see any pitfalls in the solution? Let's see if you come up with a pitfall here. This is going to work in certain scenarios like this one. But there is one scenario in which this will not work. This will actually break. So we are starting with an array of to-dos, which contains three to-dos. But what if maybe the array is empty from the beginning? Yes, exactly. So, yep. Correct, Angelo. Awesome. So if you start with an empty array, this will break because to do's dot length is zero. Zero minus one is minus one. And we are getting the element at index minus one in the array of to do's, which has no sense. So this is undefined. And to the undefined, we're asking for the ID. And this is going to break. Hello. Break. Broke, broken. Cannot read property ID of undefined. Oh, you're right. So we have to pay extra attention and check if the to do's array has at least one element. So, how can you do that? Well, we can do something like uh, I don't know. If to do's has a length, then I can do to do's of to do's dot length minus one plus uh, dot id otherwise i'm going to start with zero <clears throat> because if the array has no length my first id should be one which is zero plus one and watch out because if i write things like this without parentheses this has a different meaning this means if the to do's has a length so if there is at least one element in the array then i'm going to give you the id Otherwise, I'm going to return 0 plus 1. This is not what I want. I want to have to do's of to do's length minus 1 dot id or 0. And then this should be plus 1. So I can just add a couple of parentheses here and this will work. Or another thing that I can do, as you know, I prefer to be more clear than concise. I can create a max id variable here that stores the result of this calculation here. And then I will say that the next ID, the current ID, will just be max ID, whatever you calculated, plus one. I think this is a little more readable. Let's see if this works with an empty array now. Hello, world. This is me. Life should be. Fun for everyone. This is an old song from, uh, who was that? M Mandy, Mandy Moore. Hello world, this is me. Okay, seems like it's working. It's working for both an empty array of to-dos and also a full array of to-dos. Hey, uh. yep, seems to be working nonetheless. Nice. So, as you can see, we are creating some code that uses a lot of the things that we uh, already discovered together arrays objects some uh, array methods and we're combining all of this with other information that we didn't know like how to get elements from uh, the dom um, another thing that i like to do sometimes is to put all the references to the elements in the dom at the start of my code. In fact, if I re-render multiple times and I call this function render multiple times because every time I submit a value, I'm calling render, I'm always creating this UL 
which is never changing because ul is always a reference to that same element which is the list so sometimes i prefer to place all of the references to the dom elements that won't change up up at the top it's exactly the same you can even create every single time a reference to the input or a reference to the ul and that's fine as i told you this is still not production ready code if i had to create a, an application a web application i would never do it like this because nowadays there are so many cool javascript frameworks that allow me to do things in a better way in a more performant way for example every single time i add a new to do to the array of to do's i'm wiping out all of the list and i'm recreating every single time this is not performance this is not what i would, would like to do every single time i create a new array of to do's this list gets destroyed and recreated from scratch if i had more than three to do's maybe 100 1000 even 1 million this would be really really not performant right so that's why if i'm not using a framework i would probably never do this i would probably append the to do to the array of to do's in my code but i will also append the new li to the elements of the ul just append that one li instead of destroying everything and recreating everything but writing code like that is actually pretty difficult it's difficult to track the changes between your business logic let's say and the changes in your dom in your web page that's where frameworks get to your rescue a framework like react will help you create a code that is very very similar to this one almost identical but react internally is able to compute the changes necessary to get to the new situation starting from the previous situation you declare you sorry i'm i'm destroying things what happened okay i created the action render multiple times so in in frameworks like react or even vue.js or angular uh, what you do is write code exactly like this you specify the state of your application how to change the state of your application how to render the current state of your application and the framework itself will compute the minimum amount of steps necessary to adapt your changes into the new uh, ui layout and that's why i cared a lot about doing this exercise with you guys because this is not production ready code but it's damn similar to the to the code you would uh, write while using something like react a framework using a framework like react it's exactly the same thing and if you don't believe me react list see look at this just look at this place uh, at this piece of code here this is a function called number list that given some props you don't need to care about what props are but it takes numbers from these props and then maps every number in the list with an li and then returns a ul containing all these numbers you see how this is similar to the code that we wrote there are some differences of course but the concepts are all there we are mapping a list of items which in this case are just numbers with a list of dom elements and then these things are returned uh, we're not returning here we're just appending everything into the inner html also there is a very important difference in in the sense that here we are not using template literals here we are using template strings template literals and we are concatenating things we are interpolating things but in java in react 
we are not exactly doing this. We are using a language based on JavaScript called JSX that you can see here on the right. And JSX is a strange language that allows you to, yeah, to do this kind of interpolation of JavaScript mixed with the XML, HTML tags without using those strings. But it's very, very similar. It's actually the same. And if you see this code, it will, they will actually also tell you something about the importance of having unique IDs. But for now, we don't really care about this. But yeah, in React, we need to specify this special attribute that is not a DOM attribute. It's not an HTML attribute. It's a React specific attribute. And the same goes with Angular and Vue.js. They also need this kind of attribute. This attribute allows to uniquely identify the list item element so the framework will be able to better compute in a performant way the minimum amount of steps to uh, generate the new interface based on the current state of the application. I hope that I'm not speaking uh, rubbish. Is it is it somehow clear even if you don't have a, a sound knowledge of the frameworks? Hope it does. So this looks already pretty nice. What can we also do? One thing that we can do, for example, since uh, we, already, we still have 45 minutes left, is to maybe interact with this list of to-dos. For example, I could try to remove a to-do if there was a remove button here. Will it be difficult to remove a to-do? Probably. Let's try. So what I would do is, you know what the LI that we are creating? I'm going to create a, a thing inside of the LI and this thing will be a button. And this button will have a text which will be X because the X seems like a delete symbol. What happens if I write this? Hmm, okay, I've got these X's that I can click and they do nothing. But now I want to attach an event handler to these buttons. Okay, so I just created a button here. If I want to attach an event handler to the buttons, I could probably do something like this. I can get a reference to all the buttons and this is probably not the proper way, but I want to guide you to the proper way before showing you the proper way. Because sometimes uh, if, if I show you immediately the proper way, you would uh, not see that there are other ways you could write the code, but those ways would uh, break in certain scenarios. So I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to get in a variable all the buttons that I see in the page. Const buttons is equal to document dot get element. Uh, no, sorry, uh, query selector all. Query selector all will get all the buttons in my code. Is this true? Let's do a console log. And it's an empty node list. Hmm, but I see three buttons. Why is the node list empty? The reason why the node list is empty is that in line 10, I'm referring to some buttons that were not yet created. Those buttons are created for the first time on line 26 after the first render because after the first render I create all the allies and also there are buttons so probably this console log should not be here we could try to put it right below the render maybe and this could probably have a non-empty node list 
No, not even. It's not working. So how about placing all of this inside of the render function? Still no can do. So we start having a problem. And the problem is actually the fact that I don't care where the, the, the buttons are logged. I care about when the, the buttons are declared. I'm declaring a variable that on line 10 doesn't contain any button because the buttons were not created. So in this particular case, I should probably get the buttons later, maybe here after the render. So it's not just a matter of console logging. It's not just a matter of printing those buttons. It's also when I'm referring to those buttons. I have to render at least once. And then in that case, I will be able to find some buttons and maybe even print them. In fact, now I see a node list with three buttons. So if I have this list of three buttons after the first render, maybe now I can try to add to each of them an event listener. But it's not as easy as just attaching an event listener like this. I want to attach an event listener of click to every one of these buttons. But the buttons is a node list. It's not one button. So I cannot just say, hey, buttons, uh, add event listener. This is something that we were able to do with the jQuery. jQuery it was so smart, is so smart, because jQuery is still there. It's still popular and it's still used. But jQuery allows you to attach event listeners to a single button or to multiple buttons seamlessly without you even needing to know if that is just one button, one button or multiple buttons. In our case, no, we cannot add an event listener to all the buttons like this. And we should probably iterate over all the buttons and to each button add an event listener. So... Is there a for each that we can do? I'm looking at the IntelliSense, which is not working really well. I'm trying to do a control space. Oh, okay, now it works. Yeah, apparently there is a for, le a for each. It's not a, an array method. This is a node list method. Apparently, node lists, the, the, the type of uh, element that is uh, returned, by this query selector all has a for each method. Do we even have a map? Mm, no. Reduce? No. Filter? No. But for each, yes. Yep. So apparently, as you can see, there is a difference between the type node list that we see here and the array. A node list seems very similar to an array but it doesn't have everything. It has for each, it has a length, it has entries, values, keys, just like objects, but they do not have map or filter or reduce. We cannot use them as if they were arrays, but luckily we have a for each. So in a for each, we can probably create a callback function that given a, not a cotton, a button, will allow us to do something. And for now, since I want to take everything step by step, I just want to console lock that button and check if this for each is able to work. Yep, it shows me three different buttons. So this for each is actually looping over the buttons as I expected. As you can see, my experimental and scientific approach allows me to just change one variable at a time and check if that thing works. And this is something that we developers usually uh, forget most of the times. We, have, we are facing a complex problem and uh, in order to not forget all the different pieces of the puzzle, we try to code everything at the same time. And then we come up with an error and we don't know when this error occurred. Where is the error located? But if you approach the problem step by step, one variable at a time, you are sure that the error that you incurred in is just the is related to the last thing you you created. It cannot 
well, yeah, sometimes it can be uh, related to something that you did before because you didn't take into account a special case, like in, like in this scenario. But most of the times, if you change one variable, if you add one step to your solution and you test it thoroughly, you can rest assured that that part of the code works and you can even, you know, forget about it. You close it, it works. It's not my problem anymore. So that's why I'm trying to get the buttons and then I test it, I console log them, then I try to loop over them and I test if looping works. And now I can probably add an event listener to every one of these buttons. And the event listener will respond to the event of clicking on the button. And when I click on the button, I will respond with a callback function, which as always, I will write as an arrow function that given an event will do something. What is this something? It's just console logging because I'm not sure that this event will be actually triggered. So why should I start writing code if I'm not even sure that this event will be triggered by my buttons? Maybe not. Maybe yes. Who knows? Let's find out. As you can see, I'm still using this convention of the dollar. It's not important. You can even you can avoid this dollar, but I actually prefer it like this because it makes it really, really clear when I'm referring to plain JavaScript objects and when I'm referring to DOM objects, which have a very special behavior. So now that I have these buttons, what happens if I click on the second one? Click. Ooh, I see a mouse event on this button here. Target button. And it shows in the in the page that this is the button that is referring to. So it's nice. It's exactly what I wanted. What about this other button? Click mouse event. And if I hover on the target, I see that that is the button that originated the event. So everything seems to be working. Nice. So now I can probably try to use these buttons to remove the to-do from the array. But how do I get the to-do? How do I know the index of the to-do? Or how do I know the ID of the to-do? Um, let's say, for example, that I know the index and the index is one, statically. If the index is one, then I want to remove from the array of to-dos the to-do with index one. How do I remove an element from the array of to-dos at a specific index? We look back at the tutorial, we look back at the documentation, and we remember that there is a function, a method in the arrays called splice. I hate that method but it's very useful in this case. We can say, hey, to-dos, what are to-dos? To-dos is the array that we have defined here, right? Hey, to-dos, could you please splice, starting from index, just one element? Can you remove one element starting from this index? And this will mutate the original to-dos array by removing that specific element. If I want to remove more, more than one element, I can say two, three, etc. But in this case, I just want to remove one element, that element at the specified index. Will this suffice? Probably not. If I click on here, nothing happens. Why is that? Because the effects of my state change are not free. I have to ask to re-render itself. I have to ask my application, hey, render my new situation. And this is something that frameworks like React allow you to omit. Whenever you change the state of your application, it's React itself who will understand that it has to re-render. So React and other frameworks of the, of the genre will allow you to 
never forget a re-render because React will take care of that. Let's see if it works. Click. Ooh, it seems to be working. What if I click on this one, the first one? Click. Nope. This didn't work. What about this one? Click. Nope, not even. What happens? So, this is another tricky situation. It would only remove the element on position 1. Yes, true, but now this is the element in position 1. So if I click on here, this should be removed. And even if I click on this, as you are saying, Bobby, uh, this would not remove the current element. It would remove the element in position 1. So even if I click here, it would remove this one. But it's not doing it. It's not working. So what's happening here? This is one of those subtle, subtle things that you have to take into account when you're not using a framework. What happens is that, you remember when I put buttons at the top, here, and then the array of buttons, the node list of buttons was empty? It was empty because we never invoked render before, so the list of buttons were empty. It was empty. And then we decided to first render and then get the list of buttons and in that case it's started working at least it works for the first element uh, as bobby says if i try to click on this first one this a, a strange thing happens because only the element at index one is removed i click on this one and it's not the correct one so as you can see there is still something going wrong but the other problem is that and now the buttons are not responding to my click events so what is happening here what is happening is that i got a reference to the three buttons and i attach an event listener and whenever i click i'm also re-rendering and when i'm re-rendering i'm destroying the whole list and i'm recreating it and while destroying the whole list, I'm also destroying the buttons and I'm recreating them from scratch. Which means that the reference to the buttons that I had before doesn't refer to anything else, uh, to, to anything anymore. Because the reference was broken. This reference is referencing buttons that were destroyed by the new render. So a quick way to solve this thing, which is not what I, the, the end of the exercise, will be to not uh, refer to these buttons right after the first render, but to refer to these buttons at every re-render. Because every time we re-render the list of items, we will have new buttons that will be created, and we have to listen to the events of those buttons we have to refresh to recreate a reference to the buttons because on first render the buttons will be three but at a second re-render after i removed one button i have to get again a new reference to the two buttons and the same goes when i add a new to do when i add a new to do i will have four buttons and then i will have to recreate this list of buttons and add an event listener to them. So if I put this const button etc etc inside of the render, this probably works better. Probably. Let's see. I'm going to click on this second one. Yeah. And what if I click on this one? Yes, it worked somehow. It didn't remove the index that I wanted, but it removed index one. And if I now click again, it's not working because it's not going to remove anything at index 1. There's nothing at index 1. There's just one element at index 0. So now everything kind of works. The only problem here is that I have to determine the, a, a different index here. It's not index 1. It must be something else. So... How do I get the index of the button that was clicked? And here things could get a little more complicated. There are probably multiple ways. And we can try some of them. First of all, let's see the event again. 
what does the event refer to? If I click on here, I see the mouse event and the mouse event has button zero, buttons. I don't see the index of this button in the array. It probably, this is probably not the proper place where to see the, uh, the index of the button in the array. In fact, the button doesn't hold this information. Uh, a button itself doesn't know that it belongs to an LI and doesn't know to which LI it belongs to. So there are multiple things that we can do here and probably there's no good way to do it. But one thing that we can do, for example, is to, uh, it, it's quite stupid, but it's to add a property to the button, an attribute. There are some special attributes in HTML, which I never mentioned because they are not really that important. And they are called data attributes. Data attributes are special attributes that you can add to your, uh, to your HTML elements, which contain some information that you could use. For example, data columns three, data index number one, two, three, one, two, four, data parent cars. And this is a special attribute that will never be used by the browser uh, to, to render, but it can be used by the JavaScript to get some information that you want to use. But there's also another thing that we can do pretty easily. We can use the ID. The button can have an ID instead of a data attribute. And the ID could be, well, the todo.id, which is something that we didn't care about before. Or, instead of the ID, we could use the index. In fact, the map, as you know, in the callback function, accepts the to-do and the index. But this scares me quite a bit. Because even if the index is unique in the array, because in, the, in an array you cannot have two elements with the same index, but the index is going to change over time. In fact, this one was at index 2 at first. 0, 1, 2. But when I remove the element in between, now the index is 1 because 0 and 1. So index is usually not a good unique identifier for arrays because yes, it's unique, but it can change over time. While the ID is strictly related to the element that you have currently. So you know what? I'm going to, instead of relying on the ID, which I don't trust, I'm going to rely on the ID of the to-do, which will be the ID of the button. If I have the ID of the button, then I know that event.target is the button. And if I now print the button, I see that it has an ID. In fact, I also see it from here. Now the list of my LIs has button ID 1, button ID 3. The IDs are there and will never change, even if those elements change position in the array. But still, the ID will always be 3. Since I have this ID, I really don't care about showing it to the user. The ID is something internal, internal that we developers need to show most of the time. Sometimes you want to show the ID. But sometimes you prefer not to show it to the user, but to use it internally. So what happens if I do a console log of target, event target ID? Is this the property that I can ask to the button? Yeah, apparently yes. I clicked on that and it says 2. I click on this and it says 1. Click on this and says nothing. Well, it says 1 every single time. So yes, I'm now able to get an inf a very important information from the button. I know what is the to-do, the ID of the to-do that I want to remove. But now that I know how to do this, I cannot use the index anymore. I probably need to transform the ID into an index. Or I need to find a way to remove an item from the array 
given its index. And here we've got multiple ways to do this, but my preferred way is to use the filter array method. How do I do this? Well, instead of using splice, I'm going to comment it out. Instead of using splice, I'm going to filter. I'm going to create a new array from the original to do's array. And this new array will be filtered by a predicate. The predicate will say, hey, I want all the to do's that do not have this ID. So my new to do's will be the results of filtering the to-dos array, knowing that for every to-do that I want to keep, the ID of that to-do is not the ID of the to-do that I want to remove. You see, it's actually a pretty clever solution. I didn't come up with that solution. That's why I'm saying it's clever. Uh, it's a pretty clever solution. You have an original array. You know that you want to remove an element from that array given its ID. So you are going to create a filtered array in which you make all the to-dos pass except that one which has the ID that you want to remove. So here, every to-do will be kept if their ID is different from the ID that we found that is associated to the button. You know what, I'm going to also add uh, a new variable here, which I think is uh, a little better. Const ID is the event target ID. And I'm going to just say ID. Or if you want to have it even more explicit, this is the ID to remove. This is the ID of the to-do that I want to remove. And filter will keep only the elements whose ID is not equal to the ID that I want to remove. And filter doesn't change the array, it creates a new array. So that's why I'm also assigning the result of todos filter as the new value of todos. And this is why I declare todos as a let and not a const, because I knew that at a certain point I had to assign it a new value. Let's see if this works. Click on here. No, it's not working. <laughs> okay. Let me just refresh. No, it's not working. Okay. So there's probably something strange going on and I have to check it. Uh, you know what? Let's debug. We could probably debug. So I'm going to the sources panel. This is my JavaScript. And I'm going to add a breakpoint here and see what happens when I click here. Okay, event.target.id. ID is two, but two is a string when I have my IDs as numbers. Ooh, so probably the problem is with the conversion. This ID should be converted into a number, especially when I do strict equality or strict disequality, unequality. So let's convert it into a number. And if you don't like the trick of doing the plus, we can convert it explicitly by saying, hey, you know the event target ID, this should be converted into a number. And I'm pretty sure that this will work. Let's refresh, let's click again. And now, when I step over, the ID to remove is the number 2, not the string 2. So I believe that the array will... The array currently has three elements, but after this invocation, the array has exactly two elements, which are the elements that I wanted to keep. So if I now re-render, this is what we have. And this is exactly what we wanted. So now I can remove whatever I want, and probably this also works if I say ciao. Yep, still works. Very nice. So this seems to be working. How cool is that? Is this becoming too, 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 too complicated? I would like to have some feedback uh, 
from you about this exercise. Are you able to follow? Maybe I didn't see that. What didn't you see? A little. Hard to come up yourself with it, but a very cool application session. I really like it. But why your list doesn't start with numbers? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I went too fast. I removed the number here because I didn't care about it. At a certain point, I said that the todo.id is a property on the todo that I, as a developer, care about because I need to use it to process it for my own logic. But... I don't care about showing it to the user. If I want to show a list of elements with numbers, uh, maybe I can do an ordered list instead of an unordered list. But at a certain point, I decided that I didn't want to show the user this kind of uh, this kind of information. I guess it's fine, says Bobby, but as Angelo said, it's a bit hard to come up with it by yourself. Yes, it is hard to come up with by yourself. And if you ask an experienced developer to solve the same exact problem, they will probably come up with a completely different solution. And in fact, I'm showing you this kind of uh, solution, not because I expect you guys to come up with the same solution yourselves. This is a complex scenario in which we have 47 lines of code that actually make sense that do something on the web page that animate the web page we are actually creating a real application but then as i told you this is just an exercise that is meant to show you to to get accustomed to some certain shapes of applications and you will never need to come up with this solution by yourselves this is meant to prepare you for when we, you will use a framework. And when you use a framework, you will see that most of this code is already there for you. You will only have to deal with the real business scenario. You will have to model the array of to-dos, yes. And you will also have to tell the, the, the framework what you want to do when you click on a to-do. But you will never need to uh, transform, you will never need to transform the, the, the DOM itself because this will be performed by, by, the, by, the, by the render function, by the framework. And, uh, and still, this is, uh, let's see it as a recipe that it's a shape that you will see over and over every time you create a new application. So this is not something that you should come up with. It's something that is already provided to you and you use it like this in, a, in a, even a, a simpler way than what we are seeing right now. If you're curious about it, not today, but maybe next time, I can show you what happens if we try to do exactly the same thing with a framework like React. But I'm afraid that this uh, is maybe too advanced right now. And I would probably uh, wait a few lessons before doing that. And this will also give you the time to read again this code and maybe also try it again by yourselves if you want to. The OGs of web dev must have been some next level smart dudes. Yes, yes, they are Qu quite a lot. Um, there's also another thing that I would like to do, which is very, very similar, probably, which is what if I click on the current text? I would like to have the current text to be flipped. No, sorry, not to be flipped. I would like the to do to have the done property flipped. I would like to see that seek for a job is not done, but if I click on it, it's done. This is probably something that I could also leave you as an exercise, but I'm afraid a little bit. So we can start right now, and if you don't finish, you will finish by yourself at home. But in the meantime, I'm going to do it. What I want to do is something like this. I want to wrap the text into a span, or whatever tag you prefer. I'm going to use a span because the span, as you already know, has no real meaning. Per se, it will not affect 
at all the behavior, uh, the, 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 the graphical presentation of your code. It's just a text wrapped into a spam. And I want to add an event listener to the spam. So whenever I click on this spam, I'm able to flip the done property. If I'm not using the spam, I cannot add an event listener to the text itself. I can only add an event listener to HTML elements, not to some random text, which is a string. I could be tempted to add the on click to add an event listener to the click of the li. Since I already have this element, the li, whenever I click on the list element, I will flip the none property. But in that case, I would have some problem related to bubbling, to event propagation, because the li is a parent for the button. And if I react to the click of this li, if I handle the event of clicking on the li, automatically, since I already have an event listener on the button, both event listeners will be triggered. So I will trigger the event on the button and also the event on the li. So I should probably uh, fiddle around with the stop propagation, etc, etc, or probably the simplest solution here is to have a span. And as you can see, by adding a span, I have two elements, the span and the button, which are not in a parent-child relationship. They are siblings. And when I click on the button, the event handler for the button will uh, will trigger, will be triggered. And when I click on the span, only the event handler for the span will be triggered. So having two siblings, siblings that have different event listeners associated to them will not create any problems in uh, conflicts. It will not create any conflicts or any, no problems in bubbling and propagation of uh, event handlers. Uh, the code for the event handlers of the span will be very, very similar to that of the button because I have to get a reference to all the spans and for all of the spans, I'll have to add an event listener for the click event. And this part in here will be the part that really changes. So I hope that you understood what I'm saying. I'm going to add the ID to the span too because just like with the button, I need to know which one is the to-do that I have to change. Angelo says, the done feature to cross out items still needs to be implemented, right? Um, not really. I mean, when the to-do is done, I already added the class completed. So whenever we have a, a, a to-do that is done or not done, this is already graphically shown. What I need to do still, uh, prob this is probably what you, you're saying, is the fact of changing the done property from true to false or from, from false to true. And this can be done by adding an event listener to the span. And whenever I click on the span, I get the to do given the ID and I flip its value. And then I re-render everything. So yeah, I'm going to copy all of this code. You should never do copy paste. But for, well, to, to, be, to make things uh, faster here, I'm going to do a copy paste and I'm going to paste again everything here. So I've got two pieces of codes, code that are really, really similar one to each other. This first one, I'm going to change it a little bit. The reference to buttons becomes a reference to the spans. And here too, I have to say, hey, these are the spans. Query selector all should reference all the spans now, not the buttons. And then to every span, I have to, well, I have to iterate over every span. So I'm going to also change the name of this variable here. Not really needed, but at least it's uh, more clear. And this is the part that I have to change. So I'm going to remove everything. No, wait a second. I'm not going to change everything. Uh, well, I'm going to remove this one. And then this is not the ID to remove. Yes, I have the event target ID of the span, 
But this is not the ID that I want to remove. This is the ID that I want to toggle. Let's say, let's call it toggle. I'm toggling the state from done to not done and vice versa. So I'm going to call it ID to toggle. And now the only thing that changes here is how do I toggle the done property in the to-do. And there are multiple ways to do that. For example, starting from the ID, I can find the index. From the index, I can do to-dos of index and I can change that element. Or, again, using immutability, I can, th and this is pretty strange, I can use the map function because the map function, if you remember, it creates a new array with the same number of elements. The thing that we want to do now is to have something like if the ID is not the ID to toggle, then I'm going to return the to do as it is, unaffected. But if the ID is equal to the ID to toggle, then I want to change that to do and I want to return it changed. You know what? I can also use the for each. Yeah, let's use it for each. So to do's, let's remove this one. I can use the to do's for each, which is easier to grasp right now. We don't need to, um, to, to use immutability. So let's do a to do, uh, a for each on the to do's, and that's it. For every to do, we can say if the to do has the ID of ID to toggle, so if to do.id is equal to the ID that I want to change, then I'm going to change that to do, and the others will be left unchanged, unaffected. So what should I do here? I should do, well, to do.done is a property that can be true or it can be false. It could be even undefined, like in this third to do here. But if it's undefined or it's null, it's still falsy. And if I negate a false, it becomes true. If I negate a null, it becomes true. If I negate an undefined, it becomes true. If I negate a true, it becomes false. So in order to flip this variable, I just need to say that the new value for to do done is not to do done. I flipped it. And probably that's that's all. Probably. You see, I'm iterating over all the to-dos, looking for the to-do that I want to change, and then I'm going to change it. If you want, there are multiple other ways you can do the same thing. For example, you can use the find function. The find function will return the to-do that satisfies this predicate. Let's do it. Okay. To do's.find, given the to do and given this predicate, will give me the to do to toggle. And if I have this to do to toggle, then I'm going to say, let's just call it to do, come on. Well, the to do will have this property done, flipped. I don't need to iterate explicitly. I can just find the to do that I want and then toggle it. And then, of course, re-render everything. Will, it, will this work? There are so many ways to do the same things. I click on forget everything. Ooh, it's toggled. See? Yay, everything's done. So now we've performed all four CRUD operations on this web application. CRUD, meaning that we can create a new to-do, the C of CRUD. We can read the to-dos, we can retrieve them, we can show them, which is the R in the CRUD. We can update the to-do, in fact, we can change its state, and we can de-delete the to-do. And this is the base of every single web, ap web application or even not web application out there. It's just CRUD operations on some collections of data. 
And that's it for today. I think that was the most important lesson of the whole cycle because it's wrapping up all the concepts that we saw so far and it shows you how those concepts that look very abstract are now used to create a real life scenario. And of course, it's a lot of code. It's code that you probably would never have come up with. I would have never come up with if I didn't have that much experience on web applications. And you're not even supposed to come up with that kind of code. You have to, uh, as soon as we start the basics, uh, as soon as we finish with the basics, you have to start learning a framework and you have to learn how the framework works and you have to learn how to perform CRUD operations with that framework. And you will see that the framework will already provide you with almost everything that we've seen so far in, in a better way, even in a more performant way. So this is, as I told you, this is a toy project. This is not a project that you will write uh, in production, but it shows a lot. It introduces to the frameworks that you or we will discover together. Okay. That's it for today. Next time we will go forward, probably. Very cool application, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, remember to do some exercises, some homework. Remember to finish the tasks um, that are pertaining the, well, data types. We did it already. Uh, you could have a look at functions because we already saw a little bit of uh, recursion, etc. There was this exercise about the memoized uh, uh, factorial function that we never saw. And I would love to show it to you, especially when talking about recursion, closure, not even hoisting. Uh, yeah, about, what was that? Okay, yeah, and, and about objects. Um, it's actually a pretty difficult exercise, but we can try to do it together. You promised some of us a pipe, but it's cool. Okay, yeah, well, speaking about functions, I could even tell you a little bit about pipes. It's actually a matter that I tackle in this other slide, JS Functional. And instead of pipe, I'm calling it composition. But this is a very advanced concept and I would love to have this concept as optional as possible. I don't want some of you guys to commit suicide because you don't understand composition. This is something that many people do not understand and that's completely fine. So when I'm telling you about pipes and composition, you have to know that all this stuff is advanced stuff. And I'm going to tell you, but with a huge warning, don't worry, okay? So that's it for today. Thanks a lot. Have a good lunch if you still have to do lunch like me or have a good day, have a good night. And remember to eat pasta, cook faster. Bye.